Thank you, Tracy, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to officially convene today's CFPB Consumer Advisory Board or CAB meeting. I'd like to welcome the Bureau's Consumer Advisory Board members as well as members of the public. Thank you all for making time today. My name is Manny Magnon. I serve as the staff director for the advisory board and council section here at the Bureau. Today, I'll be serving as a designated federal officer for this advisory committee meeting. As background, the CFPB established its advisory committees to provide substantive information, analysis, operational expertise, knowledge of their communities, and feedback to inform the Bureau's work. The advisory committees are comprised of a wide array of stakeholders and include leaders and experts from organizations in consumer advocacy, financial education, academics, community banks, credit unions, financial technology companies, and more. You can find a full list of the Bureau's advisory committee's membership on our website at consumerfinance.gov. The CAB establishment is outlined under Section 1014 of the Dodd-Frank Act, and it charges us with an important mission. And I'll quote, to advise and consult with the Bureau in exercise of its functions under the federal consumer financial laws and to provide information on emerging practices in the consumer financial products or services industry, including regional trends, concerns, and other relevant information, end of quote. As a reminder, the views of the advisory committee members are their views. They are greatly appreciated and welcomed, yet they do not represent the views of the Bureau. Now I'd like to go over what you can expect during this meeting today. The meeting will run from 1 p.m. Eastern Time and conclude at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll start with remarks from the Bureau's Acting Director, David Wagio. Our first agenda item is a discussion on COVID-19 updates and resources. The second item is about HUMDA. And our third, uh, I'm sorry, HUMDA conversation about 2020 mortgage lending data. Our last item for today is a discussion on student lending. Following each session, there will be time for Q&A and discussion with advisory committee members and bureau staff. During the call, we'll have two 15 minute breaks. As a reminder to Bureau of Staff and CAP members, during the Q&A sessions, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please raise, use the raise hand icon uh, in the system. Uh, CAP Chair Eric Kaplan will then call you. Before you speak, please be sure to unmute your lines and provide your name, title, and organization. Please be sure to mute your lines where you are not speaking. After you're done with your comment, if you could please uh, put the raise hand function now down so we are not, we know you don't know speak anymore. Everyone should have received an email from my team with the meeting materials, including the agenda and the presentation. Please open those documents now so you may follow along with us. I am pleased to introduce uh, David Wagio, who was appointed by President Biden to lead the CFPB as the acting director. Since joining the Bureau in 2012, Acting Director Wajo has served as the Bureau's Acting Chief of Staff, as Lead for Talent Acquisition, and most recently as the Bureau's Chief Strategy Officer. Prior to his time at the CFPB, Acting Director Wajo served at the National Institutes of Health, the Office of Personal Management, and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Please join me in welcoming Acting Director Wajo to today's discussion. Acting Director? Thanks, Manny. Really appreciate that. And, and good afternoon, everyone. My thanks to you all for joining today's Consumer Advisory Board meeting. And my thanks to Eric Kaplan for his service as chair of the CAB. As with our previous meetings, I expect we will gain valuable insights into our policy development, rulemaking, and consumer and industry engagement. With your help and commitment, we are able to be proactive in keeping markets fair and competitive and protecting consumers. So thank you all for your contributions. The first session today will focus on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic through the lens of the mortgage market data and consumer complaints. We will then move into a discussion on racial and economic disparities in Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. And as many mentioned, our last session will be a discussion on student lending. 
When I began as the CFPB's acting director, I said one of my two main priorities is seeking relief for consumers facing hardship due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since then, multiple vaccines have rolled out to fight COVID-19. Almost all schools will be open this fall, and most people are either heading back to or actively searching for work. But the fast spreading Delta variant has refused to give us an opportunity to fully recover financially, physically, or psychologically. In this middle ground, consumers seem to feel the sun at their backs as they cautiously watch storm clouds forming just ahead. And so we need to ensure we are helping individuals and families participate in the recovery while doing what we can to protect them from future financial shocks caused by this pandemic. Back in March of 2020, the government knew it had to act to keep families in their homes. 18 months later, housing remains a priority. As various federal foreclosure moratoria and eviction bans end, many of the adverse financial effects of the pandemic are catching up to millions of families who now owe potentially 18 months of deferred mortgage payments or over a year's worth of monthly rental payments. So despite seeing the country's GDP return to pre-pandemic levels, we must continue to provide support to individuals and families who are recovering and not yet fully recovered. Following past recessions, some policymakers have focused on macro data to determine whether the country has recovered. Ignoring regional and household data can cause families and communities to be left behind. In fact, less than a year prior to the start of the pandemic, researchers from UC Berkeley's Institute for Research on Labor and Employment argued that stagnating wages and increasing inequality showed that many parts of the country had never recovered from the Great Recession. And right as the Great Recession hit, the AFL-CIO published an art article arguing that many workers continued to feel the effects of the 2001 economic crisis. That we seem to always have people trying to recover from the past crisis when the new crisis hits tells me that we must focus on transitioning consumers and families to the post-pandemic economy so they reap the benefits of the country's current economic growth. We have taken steps to do just that. On August 31st, temporarily amended mortgage servicing rules will go into effect. The rules are designed to prevent avoidable foreclosures while ensuring the housing market remains open, fair, and competitive. We want all qualified homeowners to know their mortgage options and to have time to make the decision that is best for them and their families. For renters, we recognize that many families continue to face the threat of eviction, rent arrears, or both. We want families to find appropriate housing, and we do not want actions outside of their control to stand in the way. As such, we released an enforcement compliance bulletin on July 1st, reminding consumer reporting agencies and furnishers of their critical obligations to accurately report rental and eviction information. We also recently launched a renter assistance finder tool on our coronavirus and housing assistance website to help renters and landlords find relief. The sooner renters and landlords can find financial relief, the better the chance of tenants staying in their homes after the CDC's eviction moratorium ends. We know more needs to be done. Throughout the pandemic, and even during this recovery stage, we have received tens of thousands of complaints each month. In the 12 months preceding March 2020, we averaged slightly over 24,000 complaints a month. Recently, the average has been more than 75,000 consumer complaints a month, a testament to the continuing struggles of consumers and their families. We are continuing to monitor and review the complaints to understand the problems and issues faced by consumers because we want to know what we can do to help consumers thrive in the post-pandemic economy. When we begin today's, today's COVID-19 discussion, we will continue to discuss the evolving economic and market effects of the pandemic. We'll explore what the data can tell us about the current financial shape of consumers and families and how we can continue to help them transition into the new economy and benefit from the national recovery. The second item on our agenda connects to my other main priority, racial and socioeconomic equity. The pandemic has highlighted the many unique struggles facing communities of color and historically underserved communities. Today, we will focus on the racial and economic disparities in the mortgage market that we have identified through Humda data. 
While Hamda data alone cannot lead us to definitive conclusions, it can help us to ask the right questions and to identify the most relevant problems. We know mortgage applications and originations grew substantially in 2020 because of the refinance boom and a pickup in home buying in the second half of the year. On the refinance boom, all racial groups saw increases, even though, as a proportion of the population, the share of refinances for Black and Hispanic homeowners declined. In other areas, we also continued to see a lack of significant improvement. Just a few examples. Black and Hispanic mortgage applicants continued to be denied at higher rates than white applicants. Black and Hispanic borrowers continue to pay higher interest rates than white borrowers. And overall, Black and Hispanic applicants and borrowers continued to have lower median credit scores and lower median loan amounts compared to white applicants and borrowers. Home ownership is important to the growth of sustained family wealth, and we need to determine how we can begin to significantly move the needle on home purchases by minority and lower socioeconomic individuals and families. Also, how do we ensure minority loan applicants pay interest rates akin to those enjoyed by similarly situated white applicants, or for that matter, even be able to receive financing in the first place? I look forward to hearing what you think the Humda data can tell us about how we can support the growth of minority wealth and increase racial and socioeconomic equity. Today's final discussion is on student lending. Specifically, we will receive a presentation on the 2020 annual report of the CFPB Private Education Loan Ombudsman. We will also receive a presentation on the CFPB's recent student loan work, and we will discuss student lending trends and themes. Student loans enable borrowers who otherwise may have been unable to enroll to go to college, and many of those borrowers are non-white or are from disadvantaged backgrounds. And as many of the borrowers are students just out of high school who may not be familiar with credit, loans, and interest rates, our work is to empower and educate student loan borrowers it's simply vital. The CFPB is committed to educating borrowers so they can make informed decisions about how and how much to borrow. On our website, we help student borrowers and families learn how to pay for college and apply for student loans, as well as provide educational resources on managing the money they receive and their rights during the repayment process. While student loans can open doors for many people, student loans can carry significant risks. Students may take out more than they can afford. Family members may jeopardize their personal financial security by acting as co-signers. And the education the loans pay for may not provide students with the desired job or career edge they are seeking. When these outcomes are due to unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices, we must hold lenders and creditors accountable. The 2020 annual report suggests we are making progress on educating borrowers and enforcing regulations. Complaints were down significantly in 2020. While the CARES Act and other COVID response measures certainly played a role in that decrease, it is almost just as certain other factors played a role as well, including CFPB borrower education and outreach, internal and external compliance monitoring, and the overall maturation of compliance management systems. But we still have a long way to go. As a share of household debt, private and federal student loan debt is second only to home mortgage debt, with current outstanding student loan debt totaling more than $1.728 trillion as of March 2021. That debt is not spread evenly across races and socioeconomic groups. On average, a black borrower will owe approximately $32,000, while a white borrower will owe closer to $18,500. The result is that black borrowers represent a disproportionate share of the $1.728 trillion. Student loan debt is also not just a young person's problem. Although most student loan borrowers are young adults, consumers age 60 and older are the fastest growing age segment of the student loan market. This trend is not only the result of borrowers carrying student debt later in life, but also the growing trend of parents and grandparents finding financing their children's and grandchildren's college education. And this is increasing debt burden, jeopardizing older consumers' retirement security at an alarming rate. So despite our progress, we need to continue research into student loan relief. Socioeconomic and racial gaps in student loan financing, debt and graduation rates, borrow education and empowerment, and student loan debt relief and scams. We're also dedicated to preparing for and assisting student loan borrowers when administrative forbearance for federally held student loans ends. During today's discussion, I want to hear how the administrative forbearance for federally held student loans has affected your communities and how you expect the eventual end of forbearance to impact your communities. I also want to hear how we can support borrowers when they resume repaying their student loan debts. On student loans and our other topics for today, 
Your feedback and insights will help us protect consumers in the financial marketplace through informing our enforcement, supervision, education, and rulemaking work. I want to thank you for continuing your work during the pandemic. We all took on so many more familial and community responsibilities during these challenging times, so your commitment is especially appreciated. We have had to constantly pivot as the effects of the pandemic have altered financial markets and communities, and we will continue pivoting as we move through this recovery and hopefully the tail end of the pandemic. I know you all can continue to adjust, and I am grateful consumers have you in their corner. I also want to acknowledge that, unfortunately, I need to leave today's meeting at 1.30 for some previously scheduled commitments. I want to assure you that members of my staff will remain throughout today's sessions and let me know key takeaways and action items. I'd like to end by updating everyone on the vacancies across the advisory committees. We continue to review applications and will make decisions in the near future. A number of outstanding individuals applied, so thank you for helping spread the word, for your service to the Bureau, and for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Acting Director. Um, now I'd like to pass this to the CAP Chair, um, Eric Kaplan. Great. Thanks very much, Manny. Um, and thank you, Acting Director Wazio. I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, first, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here today with all of you uh, and with my fellow uh, CAP members and Bureau team. And I want to echo Manny's and the Acting Director's comments uh, and welcome everyone here today. Thanks for joining us and tuning into this uh, convening of the Consumer Advisory Board. As Manny mentioned, uh, we're joined by members of the CAB and it has been a privilege to serve as chair of the CAB. Uh, I appreciate uh, the former Director Kraninger and Acting Director Wazio for allowing me to serve in that role. Uh, for me, it's been the most meaningful part of my career and the impact it's allowed me and fellow CAB members to have um, really has been remarkable. Uh, especially at a time like this. So I appreciate that and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I also want to acknowledge Lee Phillips, who's the CEO of Saver Life. Uh, she now serves as vice chair of the CAB and she will be assuming the chair role uh, when we have our turnover in a month or two. And it really has been a pleasure serving alongside her and I look forward to the transition uh, from my tenure to hers and also the uh, chairs of the CBAC, the Community uh, Bank Advisory Council, the QAC, the Credit Union Advisory Council, and the ARC, the Academic Research Council. They will have their meetings in the next two days, and so please keep an eye out for those as well. Um, I want to take a minute to uh, convey a few thoughts on the Bureau, as this will be my last public convening as chair of the CAB. And I base my thoughts on what I've seen since the Bureau's inception and how it's evolved in the last 10 years. It recently had its 10-year uh, anniversary. And uh, it was since it was established and also in the work of the Bureau and its people. A year ago, as the pandemic tightened its grip, we were all playing defense and really doing our best to navigate uh, to navigate a very scary unknown. At that time, I called the Bureau an agency at work. And that was because of its, I use the word, tenacious effort to carry out its mission in the face of a tremendous unknown. And I had the uh, opportunity to see this from a front row seat as a CAB member. The CFPB, simply put, is critical to the United States and its people. It's there to help Americans weather the challenges that we all face in simply trying to afford our lives. And that's not a blue thing, it's not a red thing, it's life for everyone. And it applies to all of us. If it may not apply to you, it certainly applies to people you know, and if you don't think it does, you're probably not looking hard enough. The CFPB and its team have put in tremendous effort to do the hard work to make sure we have safe, equitable, inclusive, fair, and functioning consumer financial markets to protect consumers, uh, to give them an opportunity for financial empowerment. And to its credit, and squarely within its mission, the Bureau is laser focused on identifying where this isn't so and working to change that for good. It's incredibly important as Acting Director Wazio just touched on, uh, just a few of the efforts of the Bureau, but uh, we know there's a ton more uh, that they're working on as well. The Bureau uh, does this by listening and learning and collaborating with all stakeholders and by doing serious work that takes into account very important diverse viewpoints to try and get policy and regulation right. I don't think I've ever seen a better and more earnest responsiveness from any corner of the government as I've seen from the Bureau throughout the pandemic. I don't say this as rhetoric. I don't say it to cheerlead. I say it because I truly believe it. And if you remember that the Bureau was established in response to the damage and devastation of the great financial crisis on millions of Americans, 
the significance of the work that the Bureau does and the steps it takes to na that it's taken now to navigate the pandemic and try to protect Americans and American families in the face of the COVID crisis, it can't be overstated. Simply put, uh, the Bureau has helped millions of Americans and American families stay afloat, stay in their homes, stay protected and empowered throughout the crisis. And if you're not aware of this, you'll hear some great examples today. But again, the, the amount of work that they've been doing is tremendous. And that's not just with respect to the pandemic and getting through the pandemic, but also in terms of the larger mission of the Bureau. So the takeaway from all this is that there's still too many Americans who aren't aware of what the Bureau does or the free resources and guidance that it makes available in its mission to help. I ask everyone who's listening in today, please share this information among your networks. Please help the Bureau amplify this message. If doing so helps even one person or saves one family, then it will be worth it. And I do think the Bureau is an agency of the federal government that touches on our day-to-day -day lives in a way that maybe no other agency does, at least not so palpably. Uh, finally, I do want to thank Acting Director Wazio for all of his efforts in helping to transition the Bureau from one administration to the next seamlessly during a period of, period of time that could not afford otherwise. Even more so, although your title may be Acting Director, there's been nothing acting about your tenure. You've led the Bureau during a crucial time when real leadership of the type that you've shown has been needed more than ever, and it's made a difference. So I offer my sincerest thanks and a thanks on behalf of the CAB for all you've done for the country. So with that, I'd like to shift to our first agenda item on COVID-19. There will be four presentations within this session, including recent Bureau research on mortgage challenges, the mortgage servicing final rule overview, work and development on recovery related Bureau resources, and co the consumer response complaint snapshot. We're joined by Bureau leaders today and subject matter experts from the Office of Regulations, the Office of Markets, and the Office of Consumer Response. They include Mark McCardle from the Office of Mortgage Markets, Kristen Wong, Office of Regulations, Terry Randall, Office of Regulations, Jessica Russell, Office of Mortgage Markets, and Barbara Maurice from the Office of Consumer Response. Uh, so with that, Mark and Kristen, I'd like to turn it over to you to begin our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Hi, my name is Kristen, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about the current market data, just what we've been seeing in the market with respect to challenges homeowners are facing. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the research the Bureau has put out this year. So on to the next slide. So this is just my quick disclaimer. Any opinions or views that I state are my own and may not necessarily represent the Bureau's views. To the next slide. So first, I just want to start off with the good news. Currently, foreclosure rates are at historic lows, and that's in large part to the federal foreclosure moratoria and the COVID forbearance programs that have provided millions of consumers with mortgage relief. The not so great news is that the federal foreclosure moratoria ended July 31st, and the pandemic is clearly not over. Many homeowners are still struggling. To the next slide. And so, you know, I think, you know, what is this, what do we see in the data? You know, how are we measuring, you know, struggling homeowners? Um, so in March, the Bureau released a report on housing and security. And this report shows just how the pandemic has affected both homeowners and renters. And it provides helpful data points um, just so people can kind of get situated with the problem that we're facing. And an important point that it brings up is that housing and security is not just about having a place to live. It affects your health, both physical and mental, your education, and it has wide impacts on communities. And in this report, we saw that, you know, at the end of 2020, 2.1 million borrowers are more than three months behind on their housing payments, which is a sign of, you know, a sign of distress. And since then, there has been an improvement. You know, the economy has recovered a little bit. 2.1 million is now 1.7 million. But this number is still much higher than the pre-pandemic days, um, nearly three times higher. On to the next slide. So, you know, what are some of the risks that, you know, can potentially come from this? Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the good stories from the pandemic is that millions of consumers have received relief. And um, one of those big programs have been mortgage forbearance, you know, where people can temporarily pause or 
uh, reduce their mortgage payments. And currently, you know, as of July, 1.9 million consumers were in four merits. So the vast majority of those borrowers that are significantly behind, you know, in that last graph are also receiving some form of relief. But one of the risks that we see is that an estimated 900,000 borrowers were projected to exit forbearance in the second half of the year, um, just because they're reaching the end of, you know, the forbearance period. And the bulk of those ex exits are happening in September and October. So very soon, uh, you know, servicers are going to need to work in a short amount of time and find the appropriate workout option for each household. You know, this could result in confusion, delays, errors, and in the worst case, avoidable foreclosures. Um, and so in this chart, I also just want to draw your attention to the fact that a large portion of these borrowers in forbearance have FHA loans. FHA loans typically serve communities of color, lower income borrowers, and first time borrowers. So these are some of the borrowers that we really want to watch out for in the upcoming months. On to the next slide. And so, you know, speaking of, I think one of the things you have to remember right now is that communities of color have disproportionately suffered, you know, the impacts of the pandemic. Um, and in May, the Bureau put out a report called the characteristics of mortgage borrowers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our Office of Research um, did some really interesting research that found that borrowers who are in forbearance or behind on their mortgages and not in forbearance are disproportionately Black and Hispanic. And then Black and Hispanic borrowers were also disproportionately likely to have less equity in their homes. So I think, you know, Director Weiju talked about this, as, you know, Eric did as well. You know, if you're thinking about just the history, you know, Black and Hispanic borrowers were hard hit during the 2008 financial crisis. And, you know, just another blow is likely to have another lasting impact on these communities and their ability to maintain and accumulate wealth. So this is a really critical time um, if we're thinking about just, you know, uh, advancing equity. And then finally, on the last slide, I just want to talk on, you know, another group of consumers that have faced greater housing security risks during the pandemic. And that is those who are living in manufactured housing, also referred to as mobile homes. And so on average, homeowners of manufactured homes have lower incomes and they are more likely to work in industries affected by the pandemic. So they were, you know, more economically vulnerable. And then also many manufactured homeowners, um, you know, they might not use traditional prop traditional mortgages to buy their homes. They might use personal property loans, also referred to as chattel loans to purchase their homes. And these loans have fewer consumer protections, which can make these homeowners more vulnerable in the case of foreclosure or repossession. So this is just another group of consumers that I really wanted to highlight today. And with that, um, I think it's time for me to pass it on to Terry. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, next slide, please. Hi, I'm Terry Randall. I am in the Office of Regulations at the Bureau. And as we've been discussing, unfortunately, um, many homeowners have been struggling to make their mortgage payments as a result of the pandemic. So the Bureau, as one of the many actions that we've taken to assist struggling consumers, the Bureau issued a final rule um, in late June um, to help consumers, homeowners who are struggling. So now I'm gonna provide a brief overview of that rule. Next slide, please. Um, this is the same disclaimer that Kristen gave, so we'll, we'll skip over that. Next slide, please. So now just a couple of high level points about the final rule. So the final rule aims to facilitate a smooth transition as um, various federal foreclosure protections expire. And Kristen mentioned some of these protections have been expiring. All of the amendments in the final rule are temporary. They are intended to protect um, borrowers during this period of time as a result of the pandemic. And um, final point here, the final rule takes effect at the end of this month, so on August 31st. Next slide, please. So there are four key amendments that are included in the final rule, and they're listed on the slide, and I'm going to provide a quick overview of each of these four amendments. Next slide, please. So the first amendment is one that we've been calling special COVID-19 procedural safeguards. So 
So these, these, uh, this particular provision aims to help ensure that borrowers have a meaningful opportunity to work with their servicer to pursue loss mitigation or foreclosure avoidance options before the servicer can start the foreclosure process. So there's a limited scope to this provision. It only applies if the mortgage loan obligation became more than 120 days delinquent on or after March 1st, 2020, and if the statute of limitations in the state would not um, prohibit the servicer from making the first notice or filing after January 1st, 2022. This provision also is temporary. It sunsets in January 1st of next year. Next slide. So a little bit about um, the operation of this particular provision. So the final rule requires servicers to ensure that one of three procedural safeguards are met before the servicer can make the first notice or filing required for foreclosure due to a delinquency. So the three um, procedural safeguards, the first one is a complete loss mitigation application review. And so this means that this, the servicers received a complete loss mitigation application from the borrower and completed all of the steps required by Regulation X for review, um, notification, and appeal for that loss mitigation application. And in general, it means that then there are no loss mitigation options available for the borrower or the borrower has rejected all offers of loss mitigation. The second procedural safeguard is um, if the property is abandoned according to state or municipal law where the property is located, and so the property being the property securing the mortgage loan. And the third and final procedural safeguard is one for an unresponsive borrower. And this means that for 90 days before the servicer makes the first notice or filing, so for those 90 days preceding the first notice or filing, the servicer has completed certain required steps to communicate with the borrower, certain required outreach. And during that 90 day period, the servicer has not, rather the borrower has not communicated with the servicer at all. And the rule provides details about what that means. And if the borrower was in a forbearance program, the last 30 of those 90 days have to be after the forbearance program expired. So that is the first key provision, the special COVID-19 procedural safeguards. Now we'll move on to the next provision. Next slide, please. So these are, um, this provision is a new exception for streamlined loan modifications. So the current mortgage servicing rules generally prohibit servicers from offering a borrower a loss mitigation option based on the evaluation of an incomplete loss mitigation application. So the final rule creates an exception from that prohibition for certain streamlined loan modifications. So the servicer can offer the borrower a streamlined loan modification if the borrower is experiencing COVID-19 related hardship and the um, loss mitigation option meets certain criteria. Now, this is similar to the exception for certain deferrals and partial claims that the Bureau adopted in an interim final rule last summer. And the, the hope with this particular amendment is that it will make it easier for borrowers and servicers to quickly resolve their delinquency after a forbearance or an extended delinquency. Next slide, please. So the third key amendment are what I've been calling expanded early intervention messages. So the existing rule has early intervention requirements, and one piece of those requirements are that servicers are required to make good faith efforts to establish live contact with delinquent borrowers on a certain time frame. And if the borrower, if rather, if the servicer establishes live contact with the borrower, the servicer then has discretion about whether to talk to the borrower about loss mitigation options. So the final rule removes that discretion in two circumstances and requires the servicer to tell the borrower about their loss mitigation options in those circumstances. So those two circumstances are, are generally if the borrower is delinquent and not in a forbearance program, and there is a forbearance program available for the borrower um, that is um, experiencing a COVID-19 related hardship. And the second circumstance is if the borrower is in a forbearance program for a borrower experiencing a COVID-19 related hardship, and it is near the end of that forbearance program. So in those circumstances, the servicer has to provide the borrower with certain prescribed information about their options. And also during that conversation, the servicer also must tell the borrower how to find contact information for HUD housing counselors. This provision sunsets on October 1st, 2022. Next slide, please. 
So the fourth and final key amendment in the final rule is um, something that I've been talking about as the timing of the reasonable diligence contact. So the current rule, the existing rules, require something that we call the reasonable diligence contact at the end of a forbearance program. This means that the servicer has to reach out to the borrower before the end of the forbearance program and ask the borrower if they want to complete a loss mitigation application. And the final rule um, retains this requirement, but just puts a little specificity around the timing and requires servicer to make, servicers to make this reasonable diligence contact no later than 30 days before the end of the forbearance period. And if the um, borrower asks for more assistance, the servicer has to exercise reasonable diligence to complete the loss mitigation application before the end of the forbearance period. Next slide, please. So thank you so much. That is our brief overview of the final of the mortgage servicing final rule. And now I will turn it over to Jessica Russell. Hey, thank you so much, Terry. Um, my name is Jessica Russell, um, and I have the pleasure today of highlighting a few of our COVID-19 resources for consumers. So next slide. Um, this is the same disclaimer that others gave, so I'll skip this. Uh, so, the protections and resources, um, there are a variety that exist for both homeowners and renters, um, but they aren't always automatic and some consumers are unaware of either their rights or their options. So, the Bureau offers a whole variety of resources um, to help consumers and here today, we really welcome your help um, to help us get out the message and boost awareness of this information. Next slide, please. So, one of our main resources is the interagency housing website. Um, it's available at consumerfinance.gov slash housing. Um, and I'll, I'll give a big shout out to our um, interagency partners for their collaboration on these resources. It's been a great way to have sort of a one-stop shop for information. So, as you can see, um, these are just screenshots. We provide information for homeowners, for renters and for landlords. Next slide. So for homeowners, we have a bunch of information, you know, texts, videos about forbearance. And so we walk consumers through that process of requesting forbearance, extending it as needed, and getting ready to exit. And obviously that last piece is really important. Um, as Kristen sort of alluded to, there's a wave of borrowers uh, preparing to exit this fall. Uh, we also have information about avoiding foreclosure and information uh, specific to reverse mortgage borrowers. Next slide. Um, and importantly, as many of you know, consumers do not have to navigate this process alone. Um, and so on every page, we encourage them to get expert help if they want it um, by, for example, contacting a housing counselor in their area and we have links to a tool to help them find uh, find a housing counselor. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also, as I alluded to, have uh, information that's specific to reverse mortgage borrowers. Um, so definitely check that out um, if you have time or if that's uh, relevant for your constituents. Next slide. And so that's all on the homeowner side. We also have a plethora of resources for renters um, to you know, help avoid eviction, help get help paying rent and utilities, make a plan, um, connect with experts. Um, and most recently, and one thing I really want to emphasize is that we just launched a rental assistance finder tool um, that's, that's very easy to use. Um, and next slide. Um, and this is just a screenshot showing the renter assistance tools to help connect um, borrowers with, or not borrowers, but renters with uh, state and local programs in their area. Um, they just search by geography and it provides uh, links to the resources available to them that they may qualify for. Um, and that can help them uh, pay for rent and utilities. Uh, we just launched this tool, but it's been very popular and I highly encourage you to check it out um, and share it widely. Um, it's a great way to connect borrowers to those resources. 
Next slide. Um, and since I'm almost out of not time, I'll kind of go through these last slides fairly quickly, but I'll just note um, a few of the other types of resources that we have. So we do have resources for landlords um, because we know that's also an important constituent and it also can help their tenants. Uh, next slide. Um, and importantly, um, we found a lot of engagement with our videos, which we provide in both Spanish and English. Uh, next slide. And we also have uh, resources available um, in several different languages. So we offer seven languages for many of our resources to try to reach consumers um, where they are. So next slide. Um, and so I would encourage you um, to check out also our digital toolkit. Um, you have, you can see the, the link down there. It's the Housing and Security Media Toolkit. Um, and that has a whole bunch of handouts and social media and potential emails. And those are all just ready made. So you can just plop them in um, to what you're doing and, and take advantage of that. So nice ready made materials uh, that we encourage everyone to use. Next slide. And so that whirlwind tour, that is just our housing resources. Um, we have also a whole bunch of other COVID related topics that we, we touch on, including you know, dealing with student loans, staying on top of bills and budgeting, avoiding scams, and a whole lot more. Um, and so you can see that there, that's at consumerfinance.gov slash coronavirus. Um, so that's the, the quick tour of what we offer. Thank you. Um, so much for the time. It, let us know if you have questions and please, please um, help us get the word out. And so with that, I will uh, pass it off to Barbara. Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barbara Maurice from the Office of Consumer Response. Consumer Response is responsible for collecting, monitoring and responding to consumer complaints. Complaints are one of the primary ways we understand the problems and issues consumers are experiencing in the consumer financial marketplace. In 2021, the CFPB has received more than 75,000 complaints per month. We use this information to support a range of CFPB activities, including our supervisory, enforcement, rulemaking, and educational work. Next slide, please. Since the declaration of the national emergency in response to COVID-19 in March 2020, we have been monitoring consumer complaints to better understand the problems and issues consumers are experiencing in light of the pandemic. We periodically publish consumer reports to share what we are seeing in complaints with the public. And in July, we publish observations about what we are seeing in products where Congress or the CFPB took action to provide relief to consumers. These products included federal student loans, economic impact payments, and eviction protections for renters. Today, I will summarize some high level observations of these reports, which are also available on the CFPB's website. Next slide, please. This past May, we published observations about what we were seeing in mortgage complaints where consumers discussed forbearance. As shown in figure one, mortgage complaints mentioning forbearance keywords increased significantly in spring of 2020. Since this initial spike and subsequent decrease in May and June 2020, the volume of mortgage forbearance complaints remained steady until increasing again in March 2021. A common topic raised by consumers in mortgage forbearance complaints concerns servicers' communications. Some consumers expressed frustration that servicers did not communicate clearly about which relief options would be available when their forbearance period ended. Other consumers described confusion with mandatory account notices. Based on complaints and consumer responses, excuse me, and company responses, it appears consumers would benefit from clearer communication from servicers over the phone and in writing. Next slide, please. In our July bulletin, 
We analyzed complaints about federal student loans, economic impact payments, and debt collection complaints related to rental evictions. For complaints about federal student loans, as shown here in figure two, we saw complaint volume decrease significantly following suspension of payments in March 2020. In their complaints to the Bureau, borrowers described issues that arose when interacting or attempting to interact with their loan servicers. Many of these borrowers described encountering issues when attempting to complete routine account activities. For example, borrowers described long delays to get answers to questions about their account status. These issues raised concerns about servicers' preparedness for when borrowers entered repayment. However, last week, President Biden directed the U.S. Department of Education to extend the pause on federal student loan payment until January 31st, 2020. Next slide, please. As shown in figure three, the CFPB received complaints that mentioned economic impact payments after each disbursement. For consumers who had overdrawn accounts, several financial institutions advanced an amount equal to the negative balance so these consumers could take full advantage of their economic impact payment. Later, when financial institutions reversed this payment, consumers reported that they were not expecting the reversal. Some consumers reported being assessed overdraft charges when the reversal happened. Some of these consumers reported that they were more overdrawn after the advance was reversed than they were before the stimulus payment was deposited. Consumers raised additional issues related to economic impact payments, including problems with account closures or difficulty assessing, accessing their funds on prepaid cards. Next slide, please. Finally, turning to debt collection complaints related to renter evictions. As shown in figure four, the volume of debt collection complaints when consumers discussed evictions were relatively consistent over the past year until seeing an increase in recent months. This increase in complaints discussing evictions may be explained in part by the CFPB's increased focus in this area. In their complaints, Few consumers described a, a current eviction proceeding where they were being contacted by a debt collector or an attorney. More often, consumers describe debt collection activities following their eviction. That concludes my remarks for today. I thank you for your attention, and now we'll hand it over to our meeting chair. Thank you. Great. Barbara, thanks. Thanks very much, and thanks to all the uh the bureau team uh, presenters. <clears throat> I'm going to open up uh, comments to the cab members now. Cab members, if you can remember to uh, raise your hands in the um, in the chat box, let me know you won't speak. In a perfect world, we'd be in person. We wouldn't have to do this, but uh, please do that. And I'll go down the list. We'll try and make it as interactive uh, interactive a conversation as we can, given the virtual virtual format. Uh, please try to keep your comments to a few minutes, but uh, we'll try and have a back and forth here. So. Uh, with that, thanks very much. Also, please identify your name and organization and role as well. Uh, let's get started. Uh, CAB members, um, I'd like to turn it over to you. We can uh, start with uh, perhaps uh, uh, Nadine Cohen. Hi, thank you so much, Eric, and, and thank you to the Bureau for um, that presentation. I, I wanted to follow up on something that was discussed, which is um, that servicers uh, often do not communicate clearly with borrowers about their post forbearance options. And I know I saw mention of this interagency group, and I'm wondering if there can be an interagency group that uh, would create a centralized escalations uh, point for borrowers who need help uh, reaching out to their servicers. And I just want to add that I think some kind of 
actual um, person-to-person -person outreach with borrowers would be helpful. I know we have a good uh, complaint mechanism, but a lot of borrowers, low-income borrowers, uh, unsophisticated borrowers are not comfortable with just computerized complaints. And I think they feel that they're not getting a real response. So I just wonder if the Bureau has any plans to have some kind of um, centralized escalation point and some way to have someone speak with borrowers directly. So thanks, Nadine. By, by the way, Nadine is uh, with Greater Boston Legal Services as well. I just want to make sure. That, Thank you. Uh, you know, and I know that you've been seeing a lot of this on the ground and we, we've uh, had conversations about it. Um, I want to open it up to the Bureau to see if they can respond to that. But <clears throat> I do want to say a really um, interesting point you raised. We know that one of the big things, and this goes, has been tremendous collaboration between industry and advocates, um, Think, think tanks, nonprofits, uh, and, and the Bureau and other agencies as well in terms of trying to create pathways to reach the most vulnerable borrowers. So the ones who may not be as responsive to servicers are, uh, you know, have a legacy of being afraid of talking to servicers because it's typically in connection with collections or foreclosures or defaults and delinquencies. Um, and it would be interesting if there was some sort of a, a centralized path or process where there could be some assistance to funnel them to the right person. I do know, and I want to, and uh, uh, one of our CAB members, Rebecca Steele, not to put you on the spot, uh, is um, a, uh, runs one of the largest uh, nonprofit counseling agencies, but I do know the drive to connect people with free nonprofit counseling agencies to try and help them navigate the process is a bit of a proxy in that regard, uh, one that I at least, I've, I've seen the benefit of it through friends and uh, other contacts uh, where those services have really helped them. So to the credit of all uh, stakeholders who are trying to create solutions, I at least think that's a good interim step. Uh, but let me stop there and see Bureau, uh, or Nadine, if you have anything else, or Bureau, if you'd like to weigh in. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'll just say that uh, I think you're right that our, we do connect folks to counseling whenever possible, and that is a good resource for consumers to talk to folks, understand their unique situation. Given the timing, you know, September's right around the corner. I don't know if we have the ability to stand up an entirely new process before the bulk of folks leave forbearance, but we are going to look closely at our complaints and see what more we can do there to sort of make sure we spot trends on the front end. And of course, plug folks in with consumers. I mean, counseling wherever possible. Just one other thing I wanted to add to that. If if there can't be um, a way to reach out to the borrowers directly, maybe some kind of dedicated team that could deal with the housing counselors and other advocates who are uh, running into roadblocks to have someone at the CFPB that we could contact. That's another possibility. Right. Thanks very much, Nadine. And, and by the way, for those watching, and that was Mark McCardle, uh, who is uh, assistant assistant director of mortgage markets, basically head of mortgage markets to those of us coming from the uh, industry who has been, I, I actually want to tip my cap to you. Mark um, has been tremendously uh, involved in the collaborative efforts between the CFPB, other agencies, and all of the different stakeholders from advocate to industry and everyone in between. So Mark, thank you for all the work that you and your team and Kristen and others have put in. So appreciate that. Um, I want to turn, yeah, no, thank you. Um, I want to turn now, uh, Nadine, thanks very much. I want to turn to Rebecca Steele uh, for next comments or questions. Yeah, great. Thank you, Eric, for that. A um, couple things that I just wanted to touch base on. One is the HUD counseling uh, piece, which I think is, is a great uh, best practice that we have refined over time. Um, but one of the things that I would suggest, uh, not only a centralized connection, but also more instructions and education. So from a standardized perspective, what are the options? How do we connect to servicers? And how do we help the consumers get comfortable uh, in a trusted way for that outreach? So I think there's, there's options for more work there to prepare 
HUD housing counselors. Um, the other thing I would just say is service or confusion is going to happen. Um, as we know, through this forbearance process, even the simplest instructions are complicated. Um, so taking a look at service or communications, just again, I know we do that constantly, but really, really important. Uh, plain English is really important. The actions that the consumer needs to take and what options they have in simple terms is also really, really important. And even with that, I would say that they're always going to need uh, a group that will need more handholding. Um, the other thing is a digital divide is real. So I would also say that just electronic outreach isn't always the best uh, because there, there are those uh, homeowners and borrowers who do not have access to even the simplest technology, broadband, phone, or even have an email address, which over the last few months, um, especially working with renters, but also borrowers, we found that those are some devices that we really need to be um, conscientious about. So, thank you. And, and again, Rebecca Steele, the NFCC National Foundation for Credit Counseling. Thanks, Eric. Barry, you're a mute. Sorry, thanks, Manny. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for for mentioning that at the end. I, I just want people to know the what you do on the ground day to day. You you have a view into so much of this directly, and um, you know see where things can go right and see where they've gone wrong. And you and your organization and organizations like yours uh, are really doing a tremendous job trying to um, connect people. One, educate them and and help them get to the resources and get resolution when they have found themselves in a, in a very difficult spot. So. Um, very important viewpoint, and thank you for that. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, May, May watson Grote. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. Um, Barbara Maurice's presentation was so um, fascinating. I really appreciated um, having the snapshot of the, um, the, um, the complaint snapshot. That was really insightful. And I was especially taken aback by the um, the spikes in the complaints about how the economic impact payments were interacting with people's accounts, um, specifically around the uh, the data um, around how consumers' accounts were overdrawn. That was actually a really small part of what we saw, um, what we've been seeing for the last year plus, that it's really kind of three steps before that um, around access. We've done most of the work with our cons um, our customers around um, eligibility um, when folks, especially when folks have an ITIN versus a social security number, um, whether in, in not filing a tax return, what impact that looks, what the impact of that is, or even navigating the, the get my um, payment tool. So we did a lot more kind of front end work and I'm just really curious um, if Barbara could comment on what perhaps the the complaint snapshot looked like, if there if there were perhaps as many complaints with regard to access, or did folks already have to feel like they were um, um, engaged with the system before they were ready to um, speak to how they were experiencing the payments? Barbara, would you like to, you're able to respond to that? And by the way, May, if you can also just uh, let the let the attendees know your name and role, that would be great as well. Just so I have some context. Yeah, uh, you. Thank you, um, May Watson Grote. I'm the founder and CEO of Change Machine, and we're um, a nonprofit fintech platform um, who serve practitioners, nonprofit practitioners nationally, to help build the financial security of of their consumers. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, May. Thanks. Appreciate it. Hi, May. Barbara, are you able to respond? Hi, yes. Um, in my analysis of the complaints, um, I really honed in on complaint information where I saw a vast majority of consumers were speaking specifically to their accounts being overdrawn. Um, I didn't see um, a, a plethora of language from consumers speaking to um, front end type of issues. They just mainly jumped into the uh, overdrawn issue in the, in the analysis of my complaints. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I'd like to turn next to Jean, Jean Setzman. Thanks so much, Eric. 
uh, Gene Sets Fund from AARP. I run programs uh, at a nonprofit that is serving the um, uh, Americans 50 plus, um, both our members as well as consumers at large. Um, my, I want to first thank the CFPB staff for sharing their insights, uh, research, as well as uh, their practices and resources on this issue. Um, and I think everybody is uh, interested in supporting um, folks through this um, housing uh, crisis that's that's looming. And I guess my question builds on what Rebecca said uh, about resources and education. But beyond that, um, uh, the work that we do at AARP, um, providing information, much as much of what I do is around education, is uh, focused on optimizing um, the outreach and understanding how people respond to uh, resources. So my question is really geared towards uh, Je Jessica Russell. And um, one thing that would be helpful as you ask for support and help, which we all want to do, is uh, a better understanding of what, what actually works. What have you seen um, in breaking through particularly um, harder to reach communities, communities of color that we see, um, again, disparate impact uh, on this issue? Um, and, help, and since we're not necessarily connected to the back end of the operations at CFPB, um, is there a way to provide insights around I think uh, we may have. Gene, are you back? Yes. Can you hear me? There may have been a bit of a freeze. Yeah. If you can, if you can uh, uh, repeat your question at the end, it was a bit of a freeze, and I, I'm not sure if it's me or you. But if you can repeat that question, that would be no good. problem. My question was really geared towards uh, Jessica Russell to see if she can provide additional insights around uh, the outreach that works. Um, I think it's. I think she mentioned uh, reaching um, consumers where they are at. Uh, but wanted to get um, one level deeper to see if there's insights around um, uh, act, uh, tactics, uh, outreach activities, um, where they've seen a, a positive response. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, so, a, a, a couple of things come to mind. Um, one is, and this touches a little bit on something that we're just talking about with the digital divide. Um, many people don't have broadband, but we are seeing uh, quite a bit of um, interest and in traffic on our resources through mobile. Um, so the variety of people or the majority of folks who are coming um, through a lot of our pages are on mobile. And so one of the things that we've really tried or to do is to optimize um, resources around that where possible. So that's definitely something that um, Especially, yeah, was something I learned um, and something that we've been focused on. Um, in terms of reaching uh, a variety of communities, um, we, we are sort of engaged in marketing efforts to reach communities um, that are vulnerable. Um, and I'm, I'm not the point person on that. Um, so I don't, I don't think I can speak to sort of what's worked and what hasn't, um, but we've we definitely, um, I know on the homeowner side, um, based on some testing, found that consumers responded well to messages around um, making a plan and so sort of taking a, a proactive approach to their forbearance, not just sort of waiting to see, but getting ready and preparing to exit. So that's something that we've uh, kind of, well, based on that insight, have, have kind of doubled down on. Um, and then the the last thing I'll just mention, because I, I only breezed over it pretty quickly, was the, the toolkit that we have. Uh, so that has um, a number of resources, you know, videos for those. Uh, we found a lot of engagement on videos. Um, they, they can be uh, time consuming to produce, but we do get a lot of engagement. So we think that's a, a very nice tool. Um, but for those who um, prefer more mailing, uh, we have a variety of, of PDFs that can be um, provided and printed um, and mailed out. So that, that's also, so hopefully that addresses your question. Thank Great, you thanks, so much. Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks, Jean, for the question. I want to say the, um, there, all of this, right, there are people who have gotten back on their feet and have been able to have the conversation about exiting forbearance and set up a plan or gotten a deferral 
uh, those are the ones for whom everything has worked. They have no issues. They're fortunate enough to be back on their feet. I, the way that I've seen it, and I know many others have as well, is what do we do about the people who have not, who still need help, who haven't resumed their employment, or who have suffered, suffered a material impairment, if not a total loss of employment and income, who just are, are still really in a vulnerable, uh, struggling position. And I've always seen this as sort of hoping, hoping to try and whittle down the population of the people who still need the help to really try and target the resources there to the extent that you can. You have to cast a much wider net. But there's been a lot of uh, a lot of efforts, and the bureau's been part of that. There have been industry and advocacy groups that are part of that. Um, th there's a campaign, the "Not Okay, That's Okay" campaign. You'll see that uh, in various uh, media, and uh, it's really been designed to try and reach the people who really need the help. And uh, that, that's something that continues along the way, because again, that's where those are the ones who are really going to need uh, the help and assistance to get out of this, while making sure that others who have gotten back on their feet are not caught up in one of the errors, mistakes, or other kinds of uh, less than ideal uh, actions that Rebecca had noted before when she said, look, errors and mistakes are going to happen. And I think it's up to us collaboratively and collectively to try and work together to make sure that we minimize those and rectify them when they do occur, uh, and then try and move forward to mitigate the possibility of them occurring again. That's that's sort of the ideal world, at least in my view. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Lee. Lee, if you'd go, Lee Phillips. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm Lee Phillips. I'm the CEO of Saver Life. We are a national nonprofit uh, using financial technology to help people save money and invest in themselves and their families. I'm also the vice chair of the CAP. And thank you everyone for the conversation this morning. And thank you so much for the staff for your hard work in putting together uh, these materials. They're very, very illuminating and uh, important. I'm curious uh, for any of uh, staff who presented today, if we're seeing any regional trends um, in the data, or are we tracking data in regional ways? A lot of the efforts uh, to get resources and help out to people, uh, particularly thinking about rental assistance and other programs like that, are really being uh, operated at state and local levels. So I'm wondering if we're seeing any regional trends in the data that could be shared with state and local government agencies, particularly those with a specific focus on financial empowerment activities, uh, both to learn what's working in um, communities that have um, who are doing well, um, or we're seeing fewer complaints, or to understand what may not be working in communities that we're seeing more complaints or uh, worse results for um, homeowners, renters, or, or other um, vulnerable constituents. Well, uh, Bureau, if anyone would like to respond, or any of the CAB members as well. This is Barbara Maurice with Consumer Response. I don't have that information in front of me, but I will definitely get back to you with an answer regarding uh, demographics related to uh, complaints that are being seen. Uh, uh, Lee, I think you're on mute. You'd think after 18 months of this, I remember. Um, that would be very helpful. Thank you, Barbara. And, and also just, you know, in terms of who is making complaints, the other side of that is who is not making complaints, right? And who may not be knowledgeable about the process or uh, the ability to engage with CFPB. Okay, will do. Thank you. You know, w one thing I'll, I'll jump in with here too is uh, another thing that's important. Um, the the physics, as I like to say, are the mechanics of the three channels of government agency, which is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, uh, government. So all the, um, the HUD umbrella entities, FHA, VA uh, and the rest and um, and non agency. Uh, the mechanics are all different. We know the application of the CARES Act is different. We know that the mortgage servicing rule that we're talking about applies to all loans, all owner occupied loans, uh, generally speaking, and the way that. Uh, FHFA and HUD in collaboration with CFPB, I think have done a tremendous job in creating consistency and translating uh, some very clear and uniform rules as to how to proceed with forbearance and exiting forbearance. Non-agency is a different story. There's less, there's nothing centralized there other than the mortgage servicing rule. Um, it's not to say it's bad. I know many entities in non-agency have attempted to provide CARES Act type forbearance but there are other rules that they have to abide by, whether they're contractual or rules of the mortgage holders. 
And so also from uh, Lee's question in terms of taking a look at the complaints, the demographics, also seeing if where the complaints come from in terms of who owns the loan uh, and who's making the decisions as to loss mitigation and coming out of forbearance, I think will be very important. I think the Bureau has signaled that very clearly, uh, and I encourage all mortgage servicers, all uh, industry stakeholders generally touching on this to be very uh, communicative with the Bureau and for the Bureau also to be communicative with those entities in order to you know, troubleshoot uh, and highlight where the areas of uh, concern are and what people are doing to try and, uh, as I mentioned before, resolve those issues. Um, that will be the way, I think, to minimize the damage up front so we're not digging out after the damage has been done and people have lost their homes or suffered you know, tremendous, not just financial, but also other losses that go with housing insecurity and loss. Um, so let me uh, let me turn to Tim Welsh. Tim, terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. And uh, really, uh, uh, by way of introduction, my name is Tim Welsh, and I am uh, vice chair of consumer and business banking at U.S. Bank. Uh, among other things, we are a mortgage servicer. And first of all, I want to commend the bureau for the remarkable work uh, that you all have done on the creation of the portal that we just described, uh, you all just described, the interagency effort. That is really a tremendous resource for everybody, and so great to see. Uh, I wanted to touch on the theme that many others have been talking about, which is how do we reach those who, for whatever set of reasons, are not in a regular dialogue with their uh, with their servicer? Because as I think you all might imagine, we really are trying very hard to make sure that we are in contact with everybody and that we're working individually with each borrower to come up with a solution that works for them. So that is certainly our intent, but as all of you have identified, there is a group that for whatever set of reasons doesn't always engage with their servicer. And so uh, it, it occurs to me that there may be a role, I'm, I'm actually asking a question, I don't have a good answer to this, but the, you know, the question is how do we collectively between the Bureau, the the organizations represented on this call and other organizations, how do we collectively reach those folks and, and connect them to servicers? And so I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, but I wonder as, as we get into the next months and we see the increase in the number of uh, people coming off of uh, their forbearance, would there be an opportunity for an example for the Bureau to say, hey, you know, servicers, here are three lessons we're learning about working with uh, people who have historically been difficult to reach. Or could there be a, a network of uh, organizations like Rebecca's that say, you know, if you're in these, if you're a servicer in these communities, here are nonprofits that you should be working with that can help uh, help people and we're finding some success. Again, I don't have a solution to this and would welcome, you know, ongoing dialogue. But as we all collectively try to reach and help these populations, which have historically been difficult to work uh, to, you know, that we've had difficulty connecting with. Is there something we can collectively do and is the Bureau, could the Bureau or other agencies be a bit of a facilitator and conduit to help uh, share information uh, and make connections uh, in these communities? So, uh, Eric, a bit of a, a question and an, and an openness on, on my part, at least, to engage in that dialogue in whatever way would be appropriate. So, no, th Tim, thank you very much. Uh, great question. Bureau, if, if you would jump in on that one. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions around um, uh, you know, just kind of figuring out where there are some gaps and over the course of the year, and again, for those who are listening, uh, there's been tremendous responsiveness. I mentioned that earlier, but to Tim's point, I, you know, I know that there's a process when it comes to delivering guidance uh, and also fielding questions, but if uh, one of you can jump in and, and field Tim's great question, that would be uh, appreciated. I think this is something that the Bureau has been very interested in. We did publish a blog in April that talked about innovative servicer communication techniques. Some servicers are using door knocking, multi-channel, they track who opens mail, they track who, who opens email, and using all the channels available. So I think we'd be very interested in, in working with you to promote innovative strategies. We, you know, we talk to servicers all the time about what works and what doesn't work. So I think uh, there, is, there is certainly room for more highlighting of the best practices there. And of course, we're going to rely on third parties and housing counseling agencies and all of our stakeholder folks to get the word out to groups, especially LEP groups and others who are harder to reach. Terrific. That's very helpful. Thank you. We're very interested in that ongoing dialogue. Great. Thanks, Mark. And thank you, Tim, for that. And by the way, again, just uh, for those dialing in, the thing about the cab 
Uh, and one of the thing that to me is also so valuable being a member on it, uh, a member of the cab is it, it's you've got a diverse group of stakeholders who come to the bureau and it's not just uh, academic, um, whatever conversations we have with the bureau, they've been incredibly responsive uh, to hear what we think. And then we can take whatever uh, comes out of those conversations and help to disseminate it across advocacy groups, nonprofits, industries. So it is, it's a two-way street and that's why um, uh, it's been such a, a rewarding program. Uh, I'm very happy to see the bureau support it. Uh, with that, let's turn to uh, Lorraine. Lorraine Brown. Okay, here, hi. Um, I'm Lorraine Brown, and foreclosure attorney with the Michigan Poverty Law Program. And I wanted to thank um, the Bureau for the work it has done. Um, I think the report and presentations have been excellent. It shows um, how much has been done and the, I, the complaints, et cetera. And also very appreciative of the temporary mortgage servicing rule which I expect will ease the transition from um, forbearance um, to post forbearance. I just wanted to sort of echo a point that Nadine Cohen made. Um, you know, currently over the months, we have seen, you know, a number or, or few servicers or, or ish, communication issues with homeowners in terms of um, communication around forbearance and also um, exit in forbearance and those have been some issues that we've seen there have been a few because of course of the um, moratorium but we expect in september the the volume or the massiveness of those complaints would um it would increase and so um to echo nadine it would be great if we there's a place centralized place to that we could receive um, Bureau could receive those um, issues and problems to resolve that. I know the Bureau, which is fantastic, which I uh, I think it's great that you are having this interagency portal and, and work with that. I'm wondering if that could be extended. Or I, I know um, we only have a, another month or so to go, and, and the concern is timing to do that, but I'm wondering with the existing collaboration with the other agencies, if um, that could set up be in place to at least have a single point of addressing um, the massive, you know, um, concerns that are communications issues between servicers and homeowners to try to resolve those issues um, effectively. Thank you, Larray. Uh, Bureau, anyone want to jump in to field the question? I mean, it's similar to the last answer. Is it something we'll look at? I mean, you know, we want to see if there's any way we can resolve issues, but there'd be a huge volume of, of sort of casework to be done if we opened up that kind of process. So there's a staffing issue, there's a training issue, there's, there's, there's lots of uh, logistical issues to address. But the point about making sure all of us are looking at these complaints in real time, we're tracking trends, we're, you know, we're seeing what we can do to sort of spot problems on the front end. I think that's something we, we plan to do a lot more of in the fall, so. Thanks, Mark, and thank you, Larray. Uh, let's turn to Nikitra Bailey. Nikitra. Hi, thank you, Eric, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to echo the appreciation for the good work of the CFPB during this time. And I also want to challenge us to um, not think about this COVID-19 um, pandemic and economic crises as being over. Um, we know that for communities of color who have been hardest hit, quite frankly, we are not participating equitably and the recovery. So I think um, we have to be very cautious as we talk about, you know, the state of the economy and 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 what the resources are to to really um, understand that not all communities are sharing um, in an equitable way. Um, in fact, the black unemployment rate and the Latino unemployment rate and even the Asian unemployment rate um, is still much higher than the white unemployment rate, particularly because the members of our communities work in the service sector. Um, it has been hardest hit and it's yet to recover. So when we're thinking about what's going on in terms of um, keeping people People housed, you know, all of the efforts that have occurred are great, and we still need to be extra vigilant and we need to do more um, to make sure that, you know, people remain housed. Um, it would be um, a catastrophe, quite frankly, if we um, end up allowing 
members of communities to become unhoused um, as a result of an ongoing um, global pandemic um, and economic crises, particularly as the Delta variant and other variants are um, continuing to have a disproportionate and negative impact on our communities. We we definitely need an equitable um, recovery, and that means that you know the hardest hit families, those that we all championed um, all you know last year and a lot of this year as you know frontline workers and essential workers, that they actually remain housed. So with 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 that point, one of the things that I want to know um, from the borough is what's being done um, to really encourage servicers now. Um, Right, the the servicing um, rule doesn't go into effect until the end of the month. But what's being done to encourage, you know, voluntary compliance um, right now, so that we can um, avoid um, families um, from being evicted um, and, and foreclosure processes from being um, moved upon. And then the other point that I want to bring up is we know um, that the black home ownership rate remains, you know, as low as it was in the 1960s. Um, we we have this ongoing investment from the Federal Reserve. You know, they're they're investing about 40 billion a month in agency backed mortgage um, securities. And that's been going on since March of, of last year. We continue to see, um, you know, black and brown communities locked outside of home ownership opportunity. Um, even the data that we continue to see from the CFPB shows us that our communities are locked out, but we don't necessarily see um, what's being done to, to really um, fully enforce our, our fair lending laws to make sure that people aren't being um, excluded for um, reasons that are discriminatory. So it'd be good to get an update on, on what's happening on that um, front. And then just this, this kind of campaign that the boroughs um, engage in, and I want to echo all the remarks about not relying on the internet um, as a way to get messages out. So has the borough taken into um, consideration some type of, you know, influencer campaign where, you know, we could learn from the efforts that the administration has already utilized in COVID and using, you know, influencers that people um, respect to really champion getting the vaccination? Is that something that the borough has given any thought to particularly um, around engaging um, faith institutions and faith denominations and sharing its resources on um, helping people with the forbearance process and also for assistance to runners. Hey, Keitra, before, uh, before I ask the Bureau to respond, because those are things that uh, not just hours and hours, but weeks, days, months, years, uh, people have spent you know, and you, one of the people at the forefront on that, if you can let the folks who are dialing in know uh, your, um, uh, your organization and, uh, and your role as well, because it's important sure. here, especially. Thanks for that reminder. I'm uh, again, Nikita Bailey. I'm a senior vice president at the National Fair Housing Alliance. NAFA is the only uh, civil rights organization that's focusing on housing justice. We work to eliminate housing discrimination and ensure equal opportunity for all Americans. Thanks. And what I want to do is see if, uh, if if the Bureau wants to take that again, there's a ton there and it's part of the underlying work uh, in terms of equity and inclusion and addressing the, the disproportionate impact uh, on black and brown communities. But um, just as by way of signaling uh, after the Bureau responds, we're going to turn to the last comment from David Eric of the cab. And then just a quick note, um, there are a few people who have raised hands from in terms of public attendees. Given the agenda, we unfortunately won't be able to have time because if we select one, then we won't be able to select all and uh, and we won't be able to get uh, through the agenda. But if you do have a comment, please send them if you're able to to me or to the Bureau and we'll collect them and see what we can do in the way of follow up. So I apologize uh, if we're not able to take everyone's questions at this time, but please do submit them and uh, we'll make sure to collect them and attend to them. So thank you for that. Uh, so Bureau to. Um, uh, to Nikita's points, if you would respond, and then we'll turn to David. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to respond there too. So, I mean, I'll just just get started. I mean, we are going to be tracking what servicers do very closely. They have to follow all the existing rules as well as agency guidance, and we're collecting data from them. We're looking at complaints. We're looking at all our sources to make sure that folks are not rushed through the foreclosure process. I think we're going to be continuing to put on our research agenda disparate incomes to black and brown communities who, who you know, to see exactly what the fallout is 
on the pandemic and, and especially on outcomes as we track this through the fall. Your bigger point about access to home ownership, I think, is something the Bureau is firmly focused on. You know, the QM rule was one one attempt to expand the box and make sure that 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 lots of folks have access to, to credit. I think we're going to be tracking that into 2022 to make sure that we can rebuild home ownership in these communities, which have been so hard hit. So uh, we can get back to you on some of your other points. I know we're almost at time, but uh, that's a start, I guess. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mark, and thank you, Nikita. And just again for everyone that what what Nikita just brought up and what Mark touched on, this is being delved into as deeply as can be, sort of down to the center of the earth, deeply, um, in so many facets, and it's something that. Uh, not just the Bureau, but I think all stakeholders need to pay attention to and resolve so that we don't let what is a mo moment in time uh, fleet away, but we can actually make real and change that lasts. So, um, Nikita, thank you for those questions. And uh, Let me turn to David Eric, and then we'll be at time for a short break before our next session. Uh, David, if you would give the last comment, we appreciate it. Manny, I'm not sure if uh, I'll give another second here to see if David is, uh, for some reason, I'm looking at the list. I'm not sure if he's logged in. So we'll give about 20 more seconds. If not, we'll call time. Yeah, uh, you mean David Eric? Yeah, it looks yeah, like he, he may not, may not yeah. be logged in there. So. Yeah, I did well, see okay. him. I did see him a yeah. few minutes ago, but maybe he got disconnected. Um, let's give him twenty seconds and see if he sounds good. I'll apologize for the delay. We're going to give David a chance to get back on. Uh, otherwise, we will move ahead for now. Especially for those of you who know David, it's always valuable to listen to what he has to say. Agree, agree. Yeah, but it seems like for some reason, maybe um, yeah. the internet uh, is not working for him. So um, let's just continue and uh, we can always take his questions after the meeting. If he I agree. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, this is David Eric. Are you able to hear oh, me now? I had been. Uh, uh, muted by the CFPB because uh, I wasn't on the panelist track. But as long as you can hear me, I'll keep my comments very, very short because I know we're already after time. Uh, my apologies to keep everyone waiting. I just wanted to acknowledge the CFPB for the incredible work that they're doing with regards to the uh, rental assistance finder. This is an incredible response to uh, the pending uh, eviction crisis that uh, our consumers in the United States are facing. And I also wanted to call out attention to another program that the that the CFPB is leading, which is a tech sprint on assistance for low income renters and small landlords. And the CFPB has consistently been a leader in using technology to solve consumer protection issues. And this is a really great example of that. And so I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. Uh, that is a program that launched on August 18th and it's going to continue through until December. Uh, and if you need or are interested in more information on that, you can find that on the CFPB website. Thanks, Eric. No, David, thank you. It's a great way to tie up um, the, the emergency rental assistance uh, program is something that people need to know about need to be able to access because back to Nikita's point about disproportionate impact and not just Nikita others uh, renters are really, really they're, they're facing a, even different kinds of struggles in homeowners because of the dynamics of rental versus ownership. So back to my point earlier at the beginning about amplifying the message, bringing people to the CFPB website. Um, this is something that's tangible for people. It's not just large corporations. It's not just it's not the economy. This this hits everyone's home. So, uh, David, thank you for that. Um, with that, we are at time and Bureau appreciate uh, allowing us to go a couple minutes over. Uh, we are going to take um, a 15 minute break now and reconvene at 245 for a discussion on Humda uh, titled Humda a conversation about 2020 mortgage lending data. Uh, again, all thank you, CAB and Bureau, for that great conversation. It is just a small window into the work that the Bureau is doing. I call it an agency at work. There's a tremendous amount going on there, once again, that hits uh, hits the day-to-day -day for all of us. So appreciate everyone's time and attention, and we'll see you back at 245. Thank you. Eastern. Okay.
We're at time 246 by my clock. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks if you participated or attended the first session. We're now at our second session, and uh, we're going to shift to the next item on Humda with a conversation about 2020 mortgage lending data. As a reminder, uh, you should have received these presentations via email, CAB members, um, and for those who are in attendance, you can also find these on consumerfinance.gov. For this session, we're going to be joined by Feng Lu, who's a senior economist from the Office of Research within the Bureau. And so it's not to waste any more time. Feng, if you would take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So thanks, Eric, for the introduction. Uh, can we advance to the next slide, please? So standard disclaimer applies. Uh, the opinion of you is stated by the presenter of the presenter's own and may not represent the Bureau's view. So next slide, please. So what is HAMDA? Right? HAMDA is a data collection reporting and disclosure statute that was enacted in 1975. HAMDA data are used to assist in three purposes. One, to determine whether financial institutions are serving the housing needs of their local communities. Two, to facilitate the public entities distribution funds to local community to track private investment. And three, to help identify possible discriminatory lending patterns. So, Institution covered by HAMDA are required to annually collect and report the specific information on each mortgage application acted upon and purchased during the buyer account. Next, please. The 2020 HAMDA data collected in 2020 and reported in 2021 are the third year of the data that incorporated a change made to HAMDA by the Dow Frank Act and the 2050 HAMDA. On June 17, 2021, the Bureau published a static file of 2020 HAMDA data that consolidated data from individual reporters. This data was modified to protect applicant and the borrower privacy. And the Bureau will uh, provide an updated file separate to reflect any later submission or late submissions. Next, please. The Dow Frank Act changed amended HAMDA to require reporting of 13 new data points. The 2050 HAMDA review also amended the Reg C to include 14 additional data points, revised several pre-existing data points, and changed coverage requirements. So starting with the data collecting in 2018 and reporting in 2019, the HAMDA data differs significantly from the data in previous years. Next, please. Uh, in July 2021, based on 2020 HAMDA data, the Bureau released a report about Asian American and Pacific Islanders in the mortgage market. Uh, we're planning to release uh, another annual report about the 2020 mortgage market activity and trends based on the 2020 Honda data, and that is forthcoming. Most of the presentation today is going to be based on that forthcoming report. Please, next. So, some of the highlights from that report. So, in 2020, the number of closing reporters was down by about 18.8% compared to 2019. That was the most likely due to the increase of the closing reporting threshold as a result of the 2020 HAMDA. Despite that, the number of closed and origination in 2020 increased by 65.2% from 8.3 million in 2019 to 13.6 million in 2020. And most of that increase was driven by the increase in the number of refinance loans. In particular, if you look at the number of home refinance loans secured by single family properties, that increased by whoppingly 149.1% from 3.4 million in 2019 to 8.4 million in 2020. Next, please. And this chart shows the number of application origination for single family closing loans in the past three years. In 2020, the total number of proposed single family applications was about 20.3 million, and total number of origination was about 13.4 million, both significantly higher than two previous years. Next, please. This chart gives you more detail about the trends. So it plots out the monthly number of origination between the beginning of 2018, January 2018, to December 2020 by loan purpose, home purchase, non-cash out refinance, and cash out refinance. Let's focus on the home purchase loan first. 
Typical home purchase loan volume will follow a strong seasonal pattern as housing market follows the season. You know, there's strong seasonality in the housing market. But if you look at the green line, that's a home purchase here, in the April and May of 2020, while the housing market typically would have been gearing up to entering the summer sales season, we saw a dip in the home purchase loan volume in April and May last year. We believe that was most likely due to the COVID and the pandemic and the nationwide shutdown at the time. Starting in June of last year, the home purchase volume, loan volume basically recovered and stayed at fairly high level compared to the year in the past uh, for the second half of the year, even into the winter. And that match was uh, widely reported uh, heating or overheating of the housing market, as we all know. Now, on the refi, particularly on non-cash out refi, uh, other than a dip in the last quarter of 2019, the refinance boom in 2020 actually very much like the continuation of refinance boom began that began in the second quarter of 2019. And the monthly refinance volume reached over 600,000 loans per month for four quarters in a row in the end of last year. The cash out refinance volume also increased, but that was overshadowed by non cash out refi. And the borrowers took out a new loan to take advantage of the lower interest rate for refi. So, next, please. So this chart look at the, the volume of home purchase loan origination by race ethnicity for each month. So you can see, especially for the second half of the 2020, the total volume of origination, home purchase loan origination was up for all four major race ethnicity groups in the chart compared to the year before. But because uh, non Hispanic white volume far exceed the volume of other groups. So let's see some detail and let's move on to the next chart. Next chart, yeah. So this is very similar to the last chart, except that we drop the white bars and rescale the Y axis to only show the three minority group together. And it's much more clear for you to see the increase of home purchase volume for all three minority group, Asian, Black, Hispanic, in the second half of the year. And next chart as well, please. And instead of the total number of origination, that should show the share, the each how much each race ethnic group counted for the total number of origination of home purchase law. And you can see a decline on non-Hispanic white in the second half of the year, last year, an increase of well, all three minority will be in their shares. Uh, so next, please. And this again is a zoom in to the all three minority group in terms of share, and it's much easier to see the minority share for Asian, Black, Hispanic, white, the amount of home purchase, or the all kind of for relatively larger share as the year goes on. I would say it's probably a relatively positive news to report that. Uh, next chart. Let's get to the refinance market. Uh, again, the this is by the race as I our refinance a little origination volume, number of loans. And you can clearly see uh, the refinance volume increase for all four groups here. But most prominently increase, relative speaking, is the amount of Asian. Again, let's zoom in to the next chart, you will see more detail. And this clearly show, right? So all three minority groups have higher origination, refinance loan origination volume, significant boom for all of them. But Asian is one that had most significant change. So in the increase of the refi volume. And we can look at the next two charts for the share. This one show the right relative decline of of the black and Hispanic share among refinance volume and the increase of white share, uh, Asian share among the refinance loan. And zoom in to the next chart for more detail. 
that's even more clear. You can see it visually. The increase of Asian share well, by the end of the 2020, Asian started kind of fall over around 7% of refinance loan, while the black and Hispanic borrowers a share among refinance loan have declined. Again, this is against the backdrop of the volume, overall volume increase for all groups. That's relative speaking, now black and Hispanic borrowers come in for lower share among all refinancers. So let's move on to the next slide. So in the interest time, I'm actually gonna mostly skip this slide. This is just very similar share information. This is the last one about at annual level. Those numbers will be included in the forthcoming report, but it's essentially the similar information as the previous time series chart. Let's move on. The characteristic of loans and borrowers may vary substantially by race and ethnicity. So let's first look at median total loan amount. Here they're separated by whether it's a purchase loan, home purchase loan, or refinance loan. Home purchase loan are the green bars, refinance loan are the, the dark bars. So just like in previous year, Asian uh, continued to take out the largest loan amount com compared to all other groups, while the black and Hispanic bar uh, loan, median loan amount are substantially lower than Asian and non-Hispanic. So next one, please. In terms of median credit score, so again, separated by home purchase and in green bar and refinance for the dark box. The Asian bar continued just like in previous year to have higher median credit score for both their home purchase and refinance home compared to. In contrast, Black and Hispanic borrowers continue to have lower median credit score than, than Asian and white borrowers. Again, the number will be in the report, and you can see actually the relative number of scale in this chart. Uh, let's also move on to the next one. So, how much the borrower pay? So, the Overall, the interest rate was much lower in 2020 than the previous year, but the variation of interest rate among the different risk ethnicity groups still remain. So you can see on this one, among the home purchase loan in the green bars, Asian borrowers are paying uh, median interest rate about 3%, lower than all other groups, while the black and Hispanic borrowers' median interest rate were about 3.25% at the highest. The variation among the refinance loan of determined interest rate is smaller, those in the dark part. Uh, Asian, except for Asian, Asian pay the lowest uh, median interest rate, about 8.2.875% among the refinance loan, while all other groups are paying the median interest rate at or around 3.0%. Next, please. So median total loan cost. The total loan cost are new Hamba data points that captures both of the charges by the lender as well as the charges by the many as a third party service provider associated with the premium loan. And interesting enough to see that um, in both home purchase and refinance loan, black and Hispanic, black and Hispanic white borrowers tend to pay higher median total loan call than the counterparts of Asian white. That's it. So, and also then let's move on to the next chart. The previous chart all about originated loans. This chart is about denial rate and denial rate disparity. So this is taken from the, our AAPI report, as I mentioned earlier. And just like in previous years, the black and Hispanic white borrowers are more likely to be denied compared to other groups. So in this chart, it shows in 2020, approximately about 18% of completed application by the black applicants were denied. And while well, Hispanic white denial rate was at 12%, in comparison, 
the denial rate for non-Hispanic white was 7% and denial rate for a Asian AAPI group, 10%. So that, and, and then can we last? Next slide, please. There's another chart taken from the AAPI report that uh, I should drill down a little bit more than compared to the last graph, which is by looking at the application outcome, it's the denial rate by within the AAPI group, within the subgroup, how that actually differ. So as we mentioned earlier, the AAPI group overall had a denial rate of 10%. But if we drill down by looking at some of the subgroup, which actually allowed to be reported even in the new Honda data starting in 2020 Honda data, you can see that some of the sub AAPI group actually had a denial rate similar level or even higher than Hispanic uh, application applicants denial rate we saw in the last chart. For instance, among the Vietnamese applicants, uh, the denial rate was 13%. And for the Native Hawaii, the denial rate is also at about 13, 12%. So in a way, they're really compared to about last chart, the Hispanic denial rate the show was about 12%. So this absolutely added another dimension and more richer detail when we think about the racial ethnic disparity and we think about how we even define those uh, group uh, for comparison purposes. So with that, and, that, and this, the presentation and hand this back to Eric for the panelist discussion. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you very much, really appreciate it. Um, I wanna kick off this session. I wanna repeat for a moment what Humda is and the purposes of it. And there's a, a tie-in to our first speaker, what Nikitra said on the last, uh, on the last discussion. Humda data, among other things, are used to assist in determining whether financial institutions are serving the housing needs of their local communities, facilitating public entities' distribution of funds to local communities to attract private investment, and helping identify possible discriminatory lending patterns. I want to focus on that last one to start. If you think about the national dialogue and uh, the impact of COVID, on housing markets and concerns about affordability and supply issues that we're seeing and who's being shut out, the disp disproportionate impact on certain communities, particularly black and brown communities, uh, these are among the most important topics facing the nation today. And um, if we don't get them right or we don't find solutions to the issues we're facing, we risk having another generation lost. And I wanna tie back again to our first speaker which, uh, which is Nikitra Bailey uh, and the comments that Nikitra made in the first session. So let me kick the dialogue off with Nikitra, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking the mic, I appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. Well, first let me thank the borough for, um, you know, utilizing Humda to um, share the information about um, disaggregating across um, race and ethnicity, particularly for the Asian American community. Um, it's exciting to see data um, disaggregated um, for the AAPI community. This is something that many of us um, have long championed. So we're, we're really grateful for the borough's work in doing that. So I just want to put this um, kind of information in context. Like we know that we have a history of federal policies benefiting some Americans and not all Americans. So when we, we look at HMSA data and we do analyses by credit scoring, we have to remember that credit scoring bakes in the history of discrimination in our lending markets. Um, so that's something that we have continually called for um, more attention to. Um, quite frankly, um, you know, paying your mortgage is really a analogous to paying a monthly mortgage. And for many people um, in institutions, that rental payment history is not looked at. So it's disqualifying for many um, families. We know um, that during the Great Recession, many black and brown consumers were steered into um, dangerous and risky loans when they qualified for credit on safer and more affordable terms. They got pushed out of the mortgage market that has had a disparate impact on their credit profiles. We know that those communities lost a trillion dollars of wealth that they've yet to uh, recover. We also know post Great Recession that um, lender, um, you know, extra caution and overlays has really um, denied the market a number of borrowers that it could have well served. 
the Urban Institute estimate that about a million loans a year could have been made. So we know that there could have been an additional 770,000 black borrowers in particular that are not in um, the marketplace. So I, I just kind of say that to give just a background um, as to what this data um, really shares for us. Um, and then I just have some um, questions for for the borough. The first one is, is there any consideration being given to creating a trusted researcher program so that um, others can um, get in and look at the data um, and, and really tell us um, their analyses? And also, um, is there any consideration for conducting research into the racial disparities um, and mortgage approvals and pricing with a control for credit scoring? Um, FICO specifically, and then is there any consideration being given to reinstating um, the requirements for lenders to submit HUMDA data on a quarterly basis so that we can have a real time understanding um, about what's happening on our mortgage markets? You know, I'll, I'll say it again, the Fed is investing monthly $40 billion. Most of that support is not um, benefiting low to moderate income families and families of color. We need to see more equitable opportunities across um, the mortgage spectrum. Great, Nikitra. Um, those are, as I said on the last session, that could take us not just days, weeks, months, years. I mean, that gets to the heart of what I know you do day to day and a lot of our colleagues across the, uh, across the spectrum focus on. Um, I want to turn it over to the Bureau for that and then add some commentary afterwards as a few of the other CAB members uh, will weigh in after that. But um, Bureau, if you'd like to respond to some of the teachers' questions, the trusted researcher program, that's a really interesting idea because um, not everyone gets to read everything that people put out and to the extent there's sort of uh, tech people, forgive me, if there's sort of an open source or open access to uh, a lot of the findings that really gets disseminated, could it be very helpful? So. With that, I'll stop. But Fang, if you want to uh, respond to Nikitra, that would be great. And anyone else from the Bureau as well? Yeah, uh, the first question on the trusted research program. So first, I'm an economist and not a lawyer. So it's a little hard to get into the legal wrangle about uh, what's the restriction on this. But it's one thing I know uh, our legal department is looking at it and they are actually researching so whether the possibility of uh, opening up some sort of access. I don't know specific uh, what will that lead to, but really beyond that, uh, what you're thinking of access, so there's a many different ways that bureaus are working on to expand the access uh, the, the, of the funded data or just uh, information in terms of uh, you might have some certain aggregate level, and then this individual one data set so you're sticking as uh, that could be very helpful. That's through both uh, the Hamda browser, the access on the website, and also a lot of work like office research is conducted. So that gets to our second question also whether the bureau is going to be working on, like, say, controlling the credit score, other characteristic, and looking at the racial disparity, looking at the uh, you know, outcome, pricing outcome, et cetera. And the answer is definitely yes. And this is one of the bureau's top priority. Uh, we have the data. We are working diligent on those things there. Um, as well as for the past year, past two years, each year we have released two just on the report itself. Those are the basically uh, more on the status back and a lot of information out there, but we're in the process of taking the deeper dive to look at some of the issues you care about, we care about, and just stay tuned. We'll hope we'll have something for you. And I think the last question, I'm sorry, uh, three questions, third one is about uh, finding the quarterly submissions. Quarterly submissions. So, yes, that was quarterly submissions. So, by the rec, say the 2015 Nahamna quarterly submission actually uh, was required for a large lender with annual volume over 60,000 in application, not in the purchase limits. So, that was suspended last year due to the pandemic, and this is resumed in 2021. So for those largest uh, reporters, they will be filing quarterly, and we'll have the access to that. Um, and we're working on ways to use this, um, useful information, statistics, I want to see what's the most relevant, most useful, and most timely information we have produced for the public based on the quarterly file. 
Thank you. Appreciate it. And, you know, I, um, one quick thing before we move on, there's a, a few things uh, in what you talked about. And again, I want to point for the benefit of attendees today, the work that the Bureau is doing in each of these. There are things that in terms of this question about creating a more equitable, or let me let me take out the word more, an equitable and inclusive uh, uh, market. And uh, whether it's, you know, larger financial markets, consumer financial markets, it should not matter who you are. It should matter whether you can sustain the debt. And that not that doesn't just go for the you know any borrower in particular, but it also goes to the to the parts of our system that have built-in biases and legacy of discrimination. So when we're dealing with these issues and they're myriad, they're multiple. Um, there are things that can be done now. There are things that need much much deeper surgery. There could be things that require a generation to kick in. For example, if you change schools and if you increase and, and equalize school systems. You have students who won't graduate college until 20 years down the road. So there's a whole range of things though, that we must do, but they all go to the issues at hand when it comes to solving the, the problem of racial disparities uh, and, and other inequities that are in our system. So um, I do know, I, and I can tell folks that are not aware, the Bureau is very, very uh, hard at work, as are many of the organizations that uh, represent the CAB and our, our stakeholders generally. By the way, I want to mention, uh, I, I uh, am a senior advisor to the Milken Institute. I didn't identify myself beforehand. So senior advisor to the Milken Institute and on the board of Kroll Bond Rating Agency as well. Um, anyway, Nikisha, thank you for that. And Feng, thank you. Uh, I want to turn to Rebecca Steele uh, to, for a next comment. Rebecca, thank you. Great, thank you, Eric. And thank you uh, for the Humda presentation. Really, really helpful. I mean, without the data, we don't have a real good roadmap um, and we don't really understand the problems, even though we think we do. So I really uh, recognize, I mean, in the mortgage market, the Humda data really does help tell the story, but certainly it doesn't tell the whole story around the consumer. Uh, but I do appreciate the attention to detail around that. Um, I want to start a little bit just with, with pre-COVID and the challenges consumers had even before COVID started, uh, which were 60 million Americans today uh, highly concentrated in the markets that we're talking about, uh, black and brown communities in particular, who have a lack of savings, live paycheck to paycheck, cannot afford a $400 emergency. Um, fast forward post COVID, um, we uh, track a lot of data ourselves nationally across credit counseling, and those are a lot of the low to moderate income. Um, the statistics are unbelievably um, stark. Um, the COVID, uh, post-COVID environment should, saw an increase in 31% uh, non-white um, consumers coming for help in credit counseling, 27% increase in Hispanic, and a less than 50% median income for consumers, up 35%. That continues through the second quarter of 2021. So, for sure, COVID has a long lasting and continuous impact on families across our country, especially those in the low to moderate income and, and people of color communities. A um, couple points and then a question. One is really when we look at the consumers for mortgage activity, we see a lot of what's happening in mortgages and, and the disparity for sure there, but that's also happening across other banking products, um, whether that's credit cards, other unsecured loans, um, or other access to credit, as, as Nikita was talking about. I think it's a really interesting opportunity, potentially, to take another look at uh, this type of Honda data across more markets. And I know there's market research uh, that happens at the CFPB. Um, but what can be done across the other markets to really understand the, the brutal impact um, across these consumers, not only are they not able to qualify uh, for mortgage loans and, and begin that wealth building process, but they really struggle day to day to make ends meet. Um, we talk, I, I, I've heard the Bureau and, and other organizations talk about overdraft fees and other what I call poor taxes that continue to keep people down. I think it's really important to bring more clarity to these products. Um, and their impact on consumers and consumer segments. Um, so that's one, one question. What can be done to uh, bring Humda data across more banking products? 
um, and understand the impacts. The second question is really education. I think the Bureau has done just a terrific job and, and I also want to congratulate them for the renter uh, and landlord uh, work that they've done on education. Education um, is really the first step, but it can't be done without other tools, tools to put that education into action. Um, so, you know, as the Bureau thinking about anything from an action support um, to go along with the education um, and, and what might that be to really help people with a trusted advisor sort of start to build their plan, their roadmap um, to, to, to get more, more credit and, and more credit healthy. So that's my question. Thank you. No, Rebecca, thank you. Great question. So, uh, Fang, if you want to weigh in, and again, any other uh, Bureau staff that touches on those questions from Rebecca, who once again, I want to remind folks, sees this from the front lines uh, as uh, CEO of NFCC, uh, that would be great. So, I'll turn it over to the Bureau for response. Yeah, okay. So, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, it's very interesting you mentioned that we're the making ends meet. We actually has a survey, a name making ends meet survey. That they try to address the exactly the same type of question that you raised. That is the how the consumer uh, like day to day uh, how they handling those, those basic needs and in their financial various financial situation, especially in a time like this. On the larger question, like uh, besides the Honda, whether we can have a Honda type of information for other financial products, uh, that is a little difficult question. Answer again as an economist, not a lawyer. I, but I said no. That's uh, right. So um, we have a Honda because that was in the law that the what right implements through regulation. So we have started to collect the reporters that have to report those information there. There are no such a law in place to collect say Honda like information on the, say credit card application, on auto loan applications. But Within the data, at least within the office research in particular, we have uh, so various other data source resources that can help us to uh, dive into some of those uh, other credit market in addition to the mortgage. For instance, right, one of the big data assets that we have is about what we call a CCP like credit panel. That's one of the 48 sample of the credit information of basically of the entire country. So from that, there's a lot of things you can see through the other into the other credit market, like the credit card auto, student loan available within the CCP. Obviously, limitation of that, we can talk about that, could go all the way into how about those uh, credit invisible, not collected information, not reported to the credit bureau. That's the one, the whole, like, I think everyone is facing. That's uh, working to address that maybe through the various different our data, alternative credit scoring data, et cetera, so we well, can have more of a view into that segment. Uh, within the CCP, there are a lot of things that office research actually engaging in looking at the question you are uh, interested in, a lot of people are interested in. And again, like the example, the survey, like making means and make, making ends of survey. I'm not expert on that, but I really encourage you to take a look. I think there's a lot of information also available online that's really helpful for the consumer production purpose. So then would I answer that question or yeah no I appreciate it. Thank thank you. Yes thanks. Thanks. You know Rebecca the uh um back to the part you know it's funny the you talk about other products and when you get down to it and we talk about financial empowerment and financial literacy um the CFPB director last October was on a panel of mine along with uh, uh, John Hope Bryant and Soledad O'Brien. And John Hope Bryant had said financial literacy is the new civil rights issue of our time. Uh, and sort of, I, I kind of buy into that. I do buy into that because without it, we can only go so far if we don't create financial uh, capability across the board. And um, and part of that is if you have a dollar in your pocket, it, that dollar doesn't know if it's going to pay for uh, your mortgage loan your credit card, your auto loan, and if your debts exceed the dollars that you have, you have to make a choice. And the impact of the choices that you make could determine, uh, will determine what happens next in your life, whether you find yourself out on the streets, whether you find yourself hungry, whether you find yourself unable to access health care. And so that, you know, what comes out in the making ends meet survey and, and uh, what you 
and your colleagues counsel people through. Again, this is just another example of how the Bureau touches on people's lives as the primary regulator for all these consumer products, which is another reason why these convenings and the work that the Bureau does is so important. Um, and uh, so I, I want to just wanted to throw that in there and turn it over to, I think Nikitra has a few other uh, follow on comments uh, next. Nikitra. Thanks, Eric. So I, I just want to agree um, um, that it's important that people have um, a good understanding of the financial services sector, but I want to be very careful that we're not um, acknowledging the reality that, you know, public policies have really determined, you know, who's going to win and who's going to be successful, right? Like we, we have a history of discrimination, particularly in the housing sector, that has really um, advantaged some Americans while disadvantaging um, many black and brown communities. So I just want to be very careful um, that that as we're talking about what solutions are um, in terms of addressing the disparities that we continue to see, that um, we, we understand that they need to be policy driven, quite frankly, and we need to see real um, what I'd like to call equity centered approaches to um, fixing some of the challenges um, that, that are really prevalent in our marketplace. I also want to ask a question um, for the CFPB, you know, just again about our nation's fair lending laws. We, we don't typically see um, robust enforcement of these tools. They're, they're really wonderful tools that can, um, you know, protect consumers, but they also help the economy overall. There have been reports that had come out last year that showed that discrimination um, overall and that discrimination included in housing cost the U.S. economy, you know, $16 trillion um, for Black Americans over the past 20 years, and that if we take steps to address this discrimination, we could actually grow the GDP um, about a trillion a year. We could also create, you know, uh, billions in local revenues for, um, you know, towns and localities through tax um, revenues, and we could create thousands of jobs. So, so has the borough, um, you know, is there an update on kind of some of the fair lending enforcement, um, specifically what what's being done around, you know, the tools that ECOA allows, you know, ECOA and Reg B permit for the use of special purpose credit programs um, for, you know, lenders to design programs for consumers that they they are not reaching. Um, I'd like to see if there's any update related to that as we talk about um, the, the mortgage market activity. Thanks, Nikitra. Feng or any of the uh, other bureau team uh, in response to Nikitra? I have to remember to unmute it. Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I totally agree with everything you say, right? Discrimination has a cost, a social cost, the externality. That's the way economists term everything, those uh, negative externalities significantly. Uh, in terms of bureau's uh, efforts, uh, ramping up is a fair lending enforcement and supervision effort, right? So, uh, Right, so I'm an economist, but I also work extensively in some with uh, our supervision fair lending side in some of the supervision fair lending exam. And there's specific of this stuff is not saying I'm freedom to discuss the specific cases, etc. But uh, in like, from what I can do, what I can sense, right? So there definitely is a much we are working very diligently at expanding our reach into the, no, I will not use the term extended reach, so that's not, so where, where we're doing is to, 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 be, to strengthen our fair lending supervision effort and how much that will lead to enforcement action, that obviously that's uh, the something down the line. But as economists, uh, we, everything is database, evidence-based, but, Back to the home that itself, to this on the data itself provided a great tool as a great base data set for us to enhance the fair lending supervision process. At least know, uh, we all know the home that data itself itself is very useful to help to, to identify the possible discrimination pattern. But in itself, it cannot be step to the pattern. Right? So there's another step there. So from that can be used a very useful. Uh, pre-screening tool for us to put in our prioritization process, using out the high-risk lender, and then their supervision process and fair the exam process that follows through the, with those things. These are all ongoing, and you'll hear more about us uh, probably in the future. Thank you. Thank you.
Appreciate it. Uh, I want to turn next to uh, our vice chair, uh, Lee Phillips. Thank you so much, uh, Eric, and thank you everyone for the, the important conversation. Just wanted to share some information from our Save a Life members. Um, Save a Life has about half a million members across the country, mostly women, uh, mostly mothers, and about 60% uh, identify as people of color. And we've recently been engaging in some early stage work to understand more from their perspectives what they see as the largest barriers to um, economic mobility and financial stability. Um, unsurprisingly, number one on that list is um, not having enough income. So that's the, the number one thing we see. What's interesting to me is that number two on that list remains uh, not having a down payment to be able to afford to buy a home. That was the, the number two priority that people had. Um, and then third on that list was um, intergenerational wealth. So the ability to inherit wealth or to leave wealth uh, to your children. And I think those two things are really interesting when you take them in combination. The understanding that for, for many people, home ownership still remains uh, a major goal and priority in building financial health and security, but also understanding and recognizing the intergenerational elements that come along with, um, with having a, a major asset like that. So um, I just wanted to share that as feedback to my fellow CAP members and also um, for CFPB staff. And then just kind of thinking about um, the road ahead, it's really great to, to see the information of where we are today. But I'm curious um, if any of the CFPB staff have comments on data sharing potentially with other federal agencies or those who run uh, home ownership programs that maybe are trying to encourage home ownership, and is there a way that we can use this data more collaboratively to to track our progress towards um, perhaps shared goals? Great, thank you, Lee Feng. Can you speak to that uh, data sharing among other federal agencies? Yeah, definitely. So okay. on the Hamda, uh, yeah, on the Hamda data itself, uh, the Hamda is a little bit. Uh, Particularly in terms of uh, ownership, who has it? Uh, so, not as so. Hamda is reported to uh, certain financial regulators, and so that is the CFPB, uh, OCC, FDIC, Federal Reserve Board, FDIC, and also HUD. So now the individual agency individually own the Hamda data. So all the financial regulator we talk about here are the member FFIEC plus HUD. So the data sharing among the agencies that Hamda reported to, that is always the case. Data sharing outside of this, whatever the Hamda reporting regular agency. Again, there's, I think there's a pretty strong legal limitation about to what extent that can happen. And that, that entire data sharing that I'm talking about individual application level data. That doesn't prevent uh, the sharing and changing information among the different agency and staff. It's more of the aggregate level information that is always at a regular agency. I appreciate that. You know, I, one of the things, and then I, I'm going to call on Nadine next, um, but one thing that would be interesting to me is to look at other internal data so sources if possible. And not to put Fannie and Freddie on the spot, but they they have the largest data set, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the market. And I know there's been a lot of collaboration with the CFPB and FHFA in many regards, but FHFA being the Fannie Freddie regulator. But looking at the Humda data and looking at the dynamics of particularly black and brown home ownership and where we are after the last decade, understanding that coming out of the crisis, uh, black and brown home ownership, particularly black home ownership, went down coming out of the crisis. And we know that some of that was crisis related. Other parts of it had to do with supply demand and uh, in increasing lack of affordability uh, based on some economic dynamics. There's other dynamics. There are embedded uh, discriminatory uh, elements to things like credit scores, at least the ones that are in use, not intentionally, I don't think, uh, or certainly if you would ask them. but. Uh, they're a product of the way that we look at income, assets, employment, and credit. And uh, so, again, not not to belabor the point, but there's a ton of a ton of elements here. Uh, and Humda data is one of the ways for us to look into what is happening in the market 
we look at the effects of what's happening in the market and then try to do some investigation as to what the root causes are so we can try and resolve them. Um, but let me stop there. I, I do think data sharing, even if it has to be uh, under cover of a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement with private sources, would be incredibly valuable uh, to the Bureau because for the Bureau, and I, I think uh, Feng would agree with this point, the more data and the more meaningful data, the better. Um, let me turn to Nadine uh, next. Thanks, Nadine. Thanks, Eric. Um, Nadine Cohen, I'm the managing attorney of the Consumer Rights Unit at Greater Boston Legal Services. And we see a lot of the effects of all this data on the ground. And one of the things that makes me um, uh, the most concerned is this data has not changed a whole lot in many, many years. In the greater Boston area and in Boston, the rate of black home ownership has not increased at all over the years. And I think the data is really important. We need to know it, but um, I, I want to, one, emphasize the enforcement part of this, taking this data and actually bringing some actions against those who do um, uh, use different standards for approvals for people of color. So that's one part. And the other is whether the Bureau um, has either the resources or the inclination to focus on specific geographic areas because we have our da data in the aggregate. And I think looking at specific markets and seeing what's going on there and in fact bringing some enforcement actions on those levels will really send a message and maybe that's the way we change things or else year after year, decade after decade, we are gonna be seeing the same data in um, 1992, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston found that people of color were 60% more likely to be denied mortgages than similarly situated whites controlling for income and credit. And I'm not sure we see a whole lot different in you know these years later. So. I really would urge um, the Bureau to be even more aggressive. And I have to say, it is a world of difference seeing the Bureau be as proactive as you are in these um, months since um, uh, January. Um, uh, and I really appreciate it all. Thank you. Well, thanks, Nadine. It goes back to that, you know, agency at work. Um, I, I really think that's appropriate. Uh, one, one quick thing before we turn. Uh, I know uh, we're going to call on Rebecca in a moment, but the agency, uh, you know, the bureau, sorry, in the Office of Innovation, sponsored a tech sprint. And David mentioned tech sprints before. Um, if, if you don't know what those are, look those up. It's a way of of people from different areas coming together to collaborate on new and innovative solutions, leveraging technology. Um, David, I hope I got you know that that uh, succinct uh, definition right. But the Bureau's Office of Innovation ran a tech sprint on credit denials, and there was some really great, it was really great work done. Interesting concepts. I think you can find the information on the CFPB website. But it goes to the point of taking a fresh pair of eyes, new lens, uh, better tools to try and understand exactly what has occurred to this point, uh, what our traditional methods have accomplished and where they've gotten us and how we can make them better, things like that would go to the part about, um, or at least, you know, help uh, um, in uh, the inquiry that Nadine just touched on and, and uh, why it's so important to undertake endeavors like that. Um, let me turn to Rebecca, you're up. Yeah, hi, I just want to make one comment on Nadine's uh, points, which are sort of the data is really showing us where uh, the opportunity is. Um, in mortgage declines, 
again, there's tens of thousands of mortgage declines. And when you look underneath that, there's a real opportunity to not just let them go and be declines, but also help them with you know, down payment assistance or other things to get housed. And I think that, you know, looking at the data from that perspective as an opportunity, I think is a real helpful one. I also uh, do agree, Eric, with your comments around Fannie and Freddie and FHA. There's a lot of data there to really help us help more people. Um, the other comment that I'll just make is, is sort of a trusted advisor in the community is really important here. Many of these families um, either went through the housing crisis, you know, 12 years ago or know someone who did. Um, and there's a real trust factor here that we see in the market where um, we'll do the outreach and, you know, their credits are already good enough to be a homeowner. So how do we also think about addressing that? Um, so just a couple more comments. Thanks. I appreciate that, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I think. Let me take a look at our list. Lee, uh, I see your hand up. So that might have been your previous. Sorry, comment. yeah, that was a that was an accident. Oh, no problem. I, I want to ask a question here. One of the one of the questions that I know the bureau is looking into um, uh, has to do with, you know, we've got. I mentioned before we have lack of affordability, increasing lack of affordability due to what's happened to the uh, mortgage and housing markets in COVID. So we already had home price increases, putting uh, putting home ownership out of reach of many in the low to moderate income buckets of our society in those segments. Um, also tighter market conditions. We have supply problems and that whole supply demand issue just continues to fuel home price appreciation. It's not the same in all markets, but if you take a look at any of the data um, and read any of the headlines, you'll know that that's an issue. And that also will have implications for renters and for the notion of cost burden. And my question for the Bureau and Feng, you may be able to weigh in on this or ask any of the CAB members to weigh in on this. It goes back to that question of cost burden. Do you have enough money to make ends meet? Do you have enough money to, to afford your life? Um, we know that renters, based on the data, are much more likely to be cost burdened to spend more of their income on their their rental amount on their housing costs than homeowners. Uh, and we know also that renters there's a, a wealth gap between uh, homeowners and renters as well. And I think one of the impacts here is that for all of the efforts and everything that's on the the plate and everything we're trying to accomplish in the way of greater uh, economic inclusion or inclusivity and equity, we stand to have another generation of people who have not yet attained financial empowerment based on not just the dynamics of the last 10 years, but really then the, the super impact of COVID, putting it out of reach for another generation. Uh, is there anything in the data, Feng, when you look at the data that you just presented, is there anything that comes to mind as either an area of opportunity or an area of concern that, uh, you know, that really merits further looking into even beyond what the bureau or stakeholders may be doing at this point in time based on the dynamics i just mentioned thanks eric for that question uh let me respond earlier to the some comments here so i definitely agree Comda itself is just data collection so the data collection itself provides information but Comda is a basically is a sunshine statue shines a light into the world, it doesn't really, itself will change the world. So there's a lot of other saying that can be done, need to be done to like, reduce the racial disparity to make the consumer, flag, a lot more vulnerable consumer, provide more of the action system to them. So definitely there. But on the, on the data itself, uh, we do think that since the 2015 Honda rule took effect and the 2000, since this Honda data starting 2018 data does provide more insight into the mortgage market on the consumer side. There's a lot more additional information now we know. Previously, we have the basic idea, but we don't have the overall comprehensive coverage of the, say, interest rate, total loan costs of, of the mortgage applicants and you know, originated loans by national coverage, pretty much and by the lender. And so by the various other characteristics we have in the market. So that is insight that is really helpful. And hopefully we'll be using that data for the purpose. And we are. And on your question about so what in the say is the 2020 data, I did see in terms of potential 
right? So there's more of the concern or opportunity to come. I would say the first thing really, when I look at the data, the first thing came to mind is how do we get some more the minority bar here, I say particularly black and Hispanic bar to take advantage of the historic low mortgage interest environment and refinance or lower their financial there's a monthly payment. So we saw the volume increase by every major group there, but apparently it's just like for the black and Hispanic borrowers, the increase is not as proportional compared to other groups. So what's the underlying reason, right? So I can think of several things. Well, why, for instance, maybe there's a, the other hurdle, like uh, because refinancing is not costly. So there's, there's some closing cost to pay for refinancing. So maybe there's a burden, the limitation is there due to all other factors that can your sound of the black and Spanish bar to take advantage of low interest rate to refinance. That could be one thing. That's just something that we should care and we try to help address and you know, work. And another thing possibly is right. So they're just also just related to education. Maybe the people were just not fully aware, or there maybe other other way we can help to motivate so the certain segment of the market of the borrowers to, to take advantage of that interest rate. And we'll proactively refinance that, and that will, in the long run, will provide more of the financial benefit. So there are many of those things there. So overall, I think the good picture when the rate lower, most of people are refinancing, but there's more segments there. You don't see them there, and that is opportunity like. Now back to the data itself, also we say I have a hundred data so great, but there are also limitations on how much data itself. For instance, how much data is about alone. It doesn't really track the borrower. It doesn't track the person. So in a way that I look at the data, I cannot exactly tell whether someone took out a loan last year, whether they actually actively financing into a new loan in the next year. So when the borrower rate is low. So that's a limitation. We can see a lot of in the aggregate level. We can see even get to the certain geographic level. That's one of the very rich aspect of how the data. Of their limitation, we can do the data alone. So that brings us to the, the other thing we can possibly look at and more resources of data and more research and we're working towards that going that sense. I really appreciate that, Bing. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to the last comment, May Watson Grote, and then we're going to wrap up uh, before a 15 minute break and then into our uh, final session on student lending for the day. So, May, you, uh, you're batting clean up here. Uh, thanks so much, Eric. Um, yeah, and mine might actually be in the vein of a request perhaps for um, a future agenda item and a future discussion point. So um, probably good that I'm wrapping this up. Really wanted to build on really the fantastic comments by both Nadine and, and Rebecca and their suggestions um, around whether it's enforcement actions or a sharper geographical um review of the data um or whether it's declines connecting the declines with future investments um advisors in communities really resonated with me um and so that actually had me thinking about um when earlier this year when acting director Weaju um named as one of his three main priorities racial equity um and wondering whether and how um, the Bureau is ap applying that lens. Um, also really appreciating Nadine's comment about um, really an urge for um, more aggressive approaches and the frustration in that we all probably experience in just seeing a lot of these like persistence and consistent data um, that, that tells us over and over again which communities are, are left behind. Um, and so a future request for the Bureau to help um, maybe connect those dots um, where we are seeing this data so um, clearly um, capture how difficult um, the and how financially insecure communities of color are. Um, how can that be applied to an equity lens for the solutions in front of us? Um, I'm actually particularly thinking of um, economists over at the Department of Labor, I know, who bring what they call a black women's best um, frame to um, a lot of the policies the Department of Labor are focusing on, where they're promoting policies that focus on pulling black women out of poverty, because that, of course, by um, necessarily um, pulls up 
many different communities out of poverty, whether that mortgage arrears and fair lending. So just wanting to draw a bright line between all of the solutions that we've, oh, the data that we are, we keep seeing the trends that is quite persistent with the solutions that we are so robustly talking about and um, the, and how the, the Bureau is bringing an equity lens to those solutions. That's great, May. Thank you very much. That's a great way to tie up um, again in terms of bringing the data to the importance of the topic. So uh, perfect wrap up. Feng, thank you very much for the presentation and the responses. Cab members, thanks for the comments as well. And uh, we'll take just about a 15 minute break. We'll start back up again at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific on the student lending session, which uh, is also top of mind right now. Uh, thanks very much. We'll see you back in uh, just about 15 minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Manny. Uh, sorry about that. It's 4 p.m. Eastern, 1, 1 p.m. Pacific, and uh, we'll now go to our last session of the day, uh, which is a very important one, top of mind for many people uh, across the country, our student lending session. Um, as a reminder, panelists should have the materials and others can access the materials on consumerfinance.gov. And we're joined today by Bureau subject matter experts from the front office, Office of Markets and Office of Consumer Education. And the participants include uh, Robert Cameron, the private education loan um, ombudsman, uh, Patricia Schersel from the Office of Markets, and Kristen Evans from the Office of Consumer Education. Uh, so we're going to start the conversation with Bob. And Bob, take it away. We appreciate it. Hi, thank you, Eric. Yeah, I'm the private education loan ombudsman at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, this afternoon's section on student lending, I will hit the part with the highlights of my 2020 report and then be followed by Pat and, and Kristen. Uh, I'll get started. Next slide, please. We'll go right to the disclaimer. Uh, basically, the views that I'm presenting are my own. If they do not represent the bureaus or bureau guidance, legal interpretation or advice, and that will apply to all presenters today. Uh, next slide, please. Here's our agenda. We're going to look at complaints, uh, COVID-19, uh, some social, economic, and racial gaps, and then the recommendations I provided to policymakers in the report. Uh, next slide. Okay, complaints. Uh, one of the important things I think to note is that the CFPB has received a record number of complaints uh, during the pandemic. Uh, however, only 1.6% of those have re been related to student loans. Uh, I think that's interesting because student loans make up 11% of household debt, uh, second only to mortgages. And if you look at the divide or the breakdown <laughs> between private and federal student loan complaints that are received, uh, we received about 28% that were for private loans. Uh, private education loans only make up 8% of the market. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so overall, uh, complaints have been trending down. Uh, now, they've been turning down since 2017, uh, but I think during the pandemic, a lot of that has uh, been related to CARES Act relief, uh, because that covers 92% of the market uh, for federal student loans. Uh, one of the notable things, though, is that even as the number of complaints have trended down, uh, the absolute number and percentage and distribution of complaints received has trended up uh, for problems with the credit report or credit score. And please also note that all complaints uh, regarding federal student loan origination are for the Department of Education. Uh, next slide. Okay, so these are the organizations with the most complaints. Uh, for federal student loans, uh, that's AES FIA. Uh, for private student loans, it's Navient. Uh, and both of those have the largest uh, portfolios in the respective categories. Uh, I think it's important to try to normalize some of the data. Uh, the CPB is not willing to take a position yet to decide how to normalize that data. So this is just some of the stuff that, that I've been looking at. And what I did is I looked at complaints that were 10,000 borrowers, uh, and that can even includes duplicate complaints. So if you break it down that way, AES FIA had 1.5 complaints uh, per 10,000 borrowers. Navient had 1.89 complaints. Nelnet had 0.83. Great Lakes had 0 0.06 complaints per 10,000 borrowers. And the not-for-profits had 1.2. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and markets will go into more detail with some of the student loan debt relief that's been offered uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so we'll just go right to the complaints. Uh, these include complaints that mention COVID-19, coronavirus, and related terms. Uh, please note that the time period is March 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2020. And then the last week, the reporting period in August was only two days, which accounts for, for why that week looks a little bit light there. 
Uh, there were more federal student loan complaints uh, than private student loan complaints. The most common issue was dealing with your lender or servicer. Uh, one of the most notable things though was the confusion that was out there with borrowers and the difference between federally held federal loans and commercially held federal loans. Because of course, if it's federally held, uh, they, they're subject to CARES Act relief. And if they're not, then they're subject to the, the lender's guidelines. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna hit some socioeconomic and racial gaps here. And gaps in, in outcomes, repayment or educational based on race or socioeconomic status I uh, suggest that there are specific risks within these systems. Uh, this presentation will primarily look at two, and that's degree attainment and who actually enrolls in post-secondary education. This uh, slide looks at the actual degree attainment rates after four and six years. Uh, degree attainment is a significant contributing factor that directly impacts student loan debt by increasing the earning capacity of many student loan borrowers. Uh, increasing earning capacity increases student loan borrowers' ability to repay, those students who take out loans but don't graduate are three times more likely to default than borrowers who complete at the same time. It must be noted that degree attainment in and of itself is not, I, let me emphasize that, is not a silver bullet in addressing student loan debt. Eliminating financial hardship or eliminating delinquency, and it's, and it's not a silver bullet for default because not all populations receive the same benefit from attaining a degree. Uh, even the highest degree attainment rates, 53% uh, for four years and 75% for six years, beg the question of whether this may be considered sufficient to strive for or whether we can do better, particularly considering the increased debt load of six years, uh, the debt burden for those that don't finish, and the opportunity cost. In other words, policy proposals likely should not be designed to achieve the current highest attainment rates across all populations, but rather consider how to exceed them across all populations. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, this looks at degree attainment and delinquency. The data is for the quarter ending December 31st, uh, 2019. And I think that's more useful than subsequent data because of the CARES Act relief. I think this also provides a snapshot that if everything else remains the same when we re-enter repayment, we could be looking at this all over again. So now's the time to make changes and adjustments and policy decisions to keep this from happening again. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, this looks at enrollment by socioeconomic quintile. Uh, this actually was a percentage of all 2009 ninth graders enrolled in post-secondary education in 2016 by socioeconomic, excuse me, socioeconomic status in 2009. What that means is that there's a longitudinal study that started in 2009 for ninth graders that looked at their socioeconomic status, and then they considered that they graduated three years later in 2012, and then they saw who actually enrolled in college uh, four years after that. So what we see here is clearly by the highest fifth, they had the highest enrollment, lowest fifth had the lowest enrollment. And the interesting thing here is students from low income families are less likely to enroll in and complete college than their peers, even when academic ability is taken into consideration. So we know there's some other factors at play here. Uh, next slide. <laughs> okay, so I provided a lot of recommendations uh, this year. Uh, the first second set of recommendations was related to CARES Act relief. And there's consistent treatment for all federal loans, whether they're commercially held or federally held. Uh, that was a big source of confusion for borrowers. Uh, the second recommendation was to extend relief. Uh, that in fact happened and it's been extended now till January 31st of 2022. And then the next uh, CARES Act relief was uh, use a phased approach for the transition to repayment. I think this is very important because in, in the student loan environment in the system, it's really geared towards onboarding about 1 to 1.5 new borrowers every year as students graduate. When we transition to repayment, it will be over 40 million borrowers transitioning into repayment. 400,000 parent plus borrowers for the first time will be making payments, and there will be three cohorts of six months each of students that graduated coming out of grace into repayment for the first time. So I think a phased approach is the most, uh, I think it's the way to go. Uh, then also simplifying existing loan forgiveness, cancellation, discharge, and repayment options. Uh, in my report, I noted just four IDR programs. There's much more repayment programs than that, but 10 different loan forgiveness, cancellation, and discharge uh, programs. I think part of the challenge with the complexity is it limits access. Uh, we value access to education, but we should also have access to what people are entitled for uh, with their student loans and relief. Uh, for income-driven repayment and public service loan forgiveness, uh, I recommend sharing information between the Department of Education, DOD, Office of Personal Management, and the IRS uh, for applications and recertifications. Uh, automation does two things. It takes the burden off the borrower, 
and it simplifies what has to happen on the back end and eliminates the possibility for, for human error. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, bankruptcy, I recommend revisiting the, the undue hardship standard. I think that has become something it probably wasn't intended to do. I think if that does get re revisited, I think it's important to keep in mind a couple of things. Number one, uh, we want to make sure that borrowers get a clean start. Um, you know, if you don't get a clean start, then you know, really what's the point? Uh, number two, we want to make sure that we do it in a way that we don't reduce access for future generations of borrowers. I also recommended that IDR enrollment be required if a borrower declares bankruptcy. And also, as far as IDR, also I recommend that they consider automatically enrolling borrowers into an IDR repayment plan at a certain level of delinquency. I recommended uh, creating and formalizing approaches to address socioeconomic and racial gaps. Uh, there is a lot of good information out there. There's a lot of subject matter expertise, and it resides in a whole lot of different areas. And I think the more we work to bring those, uh, those together, I think the more success we'll have. Uh, and also, there are successful efforts to reduce gaps in degree attainment that are, that are ongoing out there. They just don't seem to get a lot of press. Uh, where those efforts are successful, I think we should try and reinforce them. Uh, it won't be an exact cut and paste from one institution to another because there's so much variety out there in, in post-secondary education, uh, but I think there are some key principles that can be applied. And to finally reinforce successful administrative, civil, and criminal actions against debt relief scams. And I think criminal will probably be the most effective and should provide the greatest deterrent. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Kristen and Pat. Thank you, Bob. This is this is Pat Scherchel, just checking to make sure everyone can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. All through. right. All right. With regard to the student lending update, we can advance through the boilerplate slide since the same one is applied to uh, us. If you could skip ahead to slide five. All right. Um, right now, uh, well, as of March of this year, the total amount of outstanding student loan balances, um, it, whether they're borrowers who have yet to go into repayment, borrowers in repayment, borrowers who have defaulted, was $1.728 um, trillion. And this amount is still higher than it was the previous year, despite the pandemic. Um, which did um, put a dampening effect on college enrollment and did reduce the demand for loans. And even though there was 0% interest accruing on most of that portfolio out there for um, now for well over a year, there still was an increase in overall borrowing of around 3%, and that reflects the fact that every year millions of students go to college, and the only way for a very large percentage of those students to access a higher education is to rely on federal financial aid, including the federal student loan program. So every year, more loans book on, and what we've seen this year, this past year, is more loans come on, fewer than maybe previous years, but also no loans leaving the system, so it continues to grow. Next slide, please. Okay, um, Bob has already told you a little bit about the COVID safety net that was put in place for most borrowers with student loans at the outset of the pandemic. The CARES Act put in place um, a lot of protection for more than 40 million borrowers, 0% interest accrual if the government owned the loans, and the government owns 83% of that 1.728 trillion right now. A monthly suspension, uh, uh, payment suspension for all those borrowers in repayment. And that suspension preserved key benefits, borrowers seeking to qualify for public service loan forgiveness, borrowers seeking to limit the amount of time they spend in repayment by taking by enrolling in an income-driven repayment plan, which has a maximum number of payments, whether or not you successfully pay off the entire balance. So people were held um, um, harmless with that. In addition, the government suspended involuntary collection efforts on defaulted student loans, and there are 7, 8 million defaulted student loan borrowers out there with federal loans that uh, the government had been collecting on. That means no um, administrative wage garnishment, no treasury offset of your tax refund or your social security benefit. On the non-federally owned side, and um, that's those that um, 17% of loans of 
is pretty much divided among guaranteed federal loans that are in private hands and private student loans that have no federal backing. Disaster forbearance was readily available for those loans at the outset of the forbearance. It's still readily available in 90 day increments for the federal be guaranteed loans that are out there um, and private lenders still offer a fair amount of forbearance um, in often uh, increments of 30 to 60 to 90 days for the those privately held private student loans. But with regard to the those forbearance usage rates, they um, hit historic highs in the second quarter of last year, but have dropped down basically to pre pandemic levels. And because of all of this safety net, um, the scope of the safety net and the depth. Next slide, please. We have seen an extraordinary drop in delinquency rates for student loans, which after the recession for a long, long time, constantly had the highest rates of serious delinquency, those loans more than 90 days delinquent, um, among all the various types of credit. However, because of the safety net, particularly because of the safety net for the federal portfolio, the um, serious delinquency rate is now below half a percentage point, whether you measure it by the dollar amount outstanding or the number of borrowers, and this is a, a set of data that looks at borrowers who were in repayment, but had not gotten to the default stage. So uh, a key reason why we see this rate plunge is that the borrowers who are in the payment pause, which got extended um, just last, uh, last Friday, they announced the extension. Those loans are in an administrative forbearance with their servicer. However, they are being reported to the credit bureau um, as if they are in repayment and current. None of the borrowers who are in the government's portfolio in repayment are, can be considered in a delinquent status right now. Next slide, please. Anyway, and as um, we have those 30 plus million borrowers who um, are going to be asked to make payments starting in February. Um, it, uh, I think everybody read the collective sigh of relief when the announcement came out that the um, pause was going to be extended through January of next year because we were getting fairly close to the time that communications would have to start going out to the borrowers to let them know they had to go back into repayment. And there's been a lot of concern that because of the pandemic continues and is worsening right now, because of the variants um, that people weren't ready to go back. We, among these 30 some million folks, we've got 25 million or so who were basically in a repayment status at the start. And then we've got four or 5 million borrowers who have been coming out of school and going in basically a very long grace period and will go into repayment in February as well. And according to the current schedule, and these folks will be onboarded into the repayment process. They have to pick a payment plan. So it's a bit more complicated and time consuming for this particular group. And they're not new to pay. They are totally new to paying on their student loans. And then we have 9 million borrowers in income driven repayment plans, um, or they were at the start of the pandemic and the um, suspension. And that's an annual recertification process to maintain access to a low payment based on their salary. And that process can easily take a month. And so there's concern concern about all of this huge group of borrowers moving into repayment in one go, a huge number needing extra processing and the demands on the servicing system. There are also concerns about the impact on the consumer credit market. Student loans account for nearly two fifths of all non mortgage debt outstanding as the um, chart on the side here shows. And so the question is, will borrowers still be able to manage their student loan payments, which are going to average several hundred dollars at least, in addition to all their other credit payments go, uh, once the suspension ends? And the government has said it will be the final suspension. It ends in January of next year. Next slide, please. Now, in addition to orchestrating the transition into repayment, the Department of Education is also managing a transition 
of the servicing system. Um, it has been trying to onboard a totally new system, the next gen platform, um, but part of that is now under review and uh, the procurement has not been finished. Two servicers, one of the big, the biggest servicer the government has, and a smaller one in July announced that they would not be seeking to renew their contracts that end in December. And so all the servicing volume now will be go down from eight servicers to six. And those six uh, remaining um, contractors, their, con their contracts end in December as well. And so the government is looking to uh, um, establish bridge contracts that would last up to two years to create a, um, a transition period from the current servicing environment to what is going to what they want to be the more, much more modern, completely overhauled student loan servicing environment. But what's really critical here is that at the time that borrowers will be going back into repayment while the government is planning the end of the payment pause, the government also has to orchestrate a, the transition, the transfer of more than 10 million accounts to new servicers. And that also will put stress on the servicing system. So um, the return to repayment, the transition of the servicing contracts, these are areas that um, are front and center for the markets office at the Bureau to monitor. Um, and we are constantly looking at what's going on there. And just one more quick note. Uh, next slide, please. Um, about something else we're monitoring. I think all of you know that the LIBOR index that's used for all kinds of loan products is going away. And we have begun to see the, trans, uh, the, um, the transition to a new index by private student loan lenders. A little bit over half of the private student loan portfolio is probably in variable rate loans. Most of those would be tied to LIBOR. And those um, a few lenders have signaled that they're beginning to make the switch to a new index. Um, the ones that we have seen have all selected SOFR, um, the secured um, overnight fit financing rate that's published by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And these are, we've seen the switch for new loans, so new private loans being issued this fall. And this is the busy season for the private student loan industry when kids um, start college in the fall. Um, uh, making the switch to SOFR. And then sometime next year, we'll start to see lenders switch the existing loans that, uh, that are already in place based on LIBOR to a new index and most likely SOFR. But this is also something that's of a big interest to the, the Bureau because we are watching for the impact on consumers. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kristen. Thank you. Perfect, thanks so much, Pat. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief overview of some of our consumer education efforts to help student loan borrowers navigate their pandemic relief options. So at the onset of the pandemic, the Bureau shifted to engage directly with student loan borrowers to hear more about their experiences and their challenges navigating the pandemic. And we use those perspectives to inform our consumer education materials. Uh, we created a web page with commonly asked questions and answers along with a series of webinars and social media posts to inform consumers about their rights and responsibilities. We hosted roundtables and meetings to help disseminate this information into the hands of people who need them most. As was mentioned by Bob and Pat earlier, the CARES Act and subsequent actions extended the student loan forbearance period until January of next year. And so as those benefits expire next year, there will be another significant transition for student loan borrowers. So we are going to coordinate with the Department of Education to engage consumers and stakeholders so we can continue to provide consumer education as well as anticipate the challenges of this upcoming transition. Right now, as borrowers begin to receive communications about the continued forbearance period, there could be an opening for scammers to prey on the financially vulnerable. Uh, with the pandemic, many people are struggling financially and are looking for additional financial relief. And this creates the perfect breeding ground for scammers to take advantage of people. Um, with the continually changing information related to student loans, coupled with the news stories about potential loan forgiveness, this all allows scammers to feed into the uncertainty of this situation and consumers' vulnerability. So as we enter this period, the Bureau will be working to help consumers protect their finances from scammers. 
Uh, through our digital communications, our webinars, and other outlets, the Bureau has created information to help people identify the early warning signs of potential scammers, and then the action steps they can take if they have been a victim of a scammer. And this is to prevent any further financial damage. So we are asking our stakeholders and those who work with student loan borrowers to help educate and engage borrowers so they can be armed with the resources to prevent falling victim to a scammer. So in the discussion guide that we provided you today, it was obviously prepared before the announcement of the student loan forbearance extension. Um, however, the discussion questions remain valid and I look forward to the discussion today. So thanks very much. And I will turn it over to the chair to facilitate the next portion of the agenda. Thank you. Great, Kristen, thank you. And uh, Pat and Bob, thank you so much. Um, this is such an important topic and it's, uh, it's been out there in the press every day as has mortgage and other issues, but we know that student loan is student loans are a particular are particularly once again hit close to home, um, given how important uh, a product the student loan is in terms of not just um, not just life now, but for what it will mean for careers and financial empowerment for people going forward. So incredibly important topic. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to start, save some comments for later, but I, I will go on record as I typically do when someone mentions scammers to say this. Um, it takes, and I've said this before at public convenings, it takes a special kind of malice to prey upon and scam people during a period of time like this. And whether it's the Bureau, State Attorneys General, uh, other uh, agencies or departments with enforcement power, I have not met a civil fine too large or a prison sentence too long for a scammer, uh, especially in the current environment. And I cannot stress too strongly how how severe these penalties must be. Uh, in it, it, it's, I, I want to echo what Bob said that uh, we feel that at least I feel that um, those kind of penalties will uh, not only help to deter but will also punish. Both of which I think, in my own opinion, are appropriate. So I'll stop there, Rebecca. So that's on you. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, Rebecca Steele from the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. I, I wanna really focus on the cost burden uh, of student loan debt. Um, as we counsel people, credit counsel people across the United States, there's two forms of debt that are increasing significantly. One is medical debt. And I know we're not talking about that today, but that's causing an alarming amount of, of bankruptcies. It is the number one reason for bankruptcy today. And the second is student loan debt. At 1.7 trillion, the cost burden on our younger generation is enormous. And it's it's not just the younger generation, but certainly concentrated there as we see. Um, it's also in parents and grandparents um, and, and causing a lot of distress. Um, from a housing mortgage perspective, which we've been talking about a lot today, it really puts housing and mortgage out of the reach of a whole generation potentially that's coming up. Um, in fact, we did a study around single women head of household, and single women head of household had on average of those who hold, held student loan debt were in debt $56,000, regardless of whether they graduated or did not graduate. So three questions that I really have for consideration. One is uh, always discussions around disclosures, but disclosures of 18 year olds that are be counseled by uh, high school guidance counselors. You know, is it enough? Is disclo are disclosures enough? Are they mature enough with life, uh, life to really understand what potentially might hit them um, in four or six years? Second one is really, what are the colleges uh, required to do here? You know, they're selling, there's a lot of marketing, there's a lot of promises, and there's a lot of distress. With college endowments at record levels, should the colleges also be required to have some responsibility around the student loan debt and the successful payback of those? And then the third one I'll just hit because it's really close to home for me, ability to repay based on income levels, you know, servicing modifications are not simple in student loans. We help people every day. Of course, now there's less coming to us, but when those payments start back up, people will be looking to really understand how to modify based on the gap in employment or an ability to repay based on a lower income or curtailment in income. And I think that's a really big concern 
Um, historically, uh, in the last you know five years, we have not been able, from a nonprofit perspective, been able to really help people with student loan debt. Um, the servicers are really um, the only place where people can go effectively to help with their student loan uh, modifications, and I'd like to see that also reconsidered. So those are my three questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rebecca and uh, Kristen, Pat, or Bob. Any uh, comments or responses? Yeah, sometimes the three of us it's hard to know who's going to go first, but uh, <laughs> but I'll take a shot at. It. As far as disclosures and is it enough? Um, you know, if you answer a question that someone didn't ask, they don't remember the answer. Uh, but if you're able to pique their interest and get that information at the right time. Uh, they remember it. Uh, so the question is, how do you get like the 18 year olds to actually want an answer to that? And they don't even know what they're looking at sometimes. Uh, at the same time, I think there'd be a lot of benefit if every time a loan was dispersed, someone sat down with that student and said, hey, here's how much your cumulative debt is. Here's how that's going to impact your monthly payments. And I think we've seen some literature out there that actually indicates that actually limits borrowing. Um, uh, your last two questions, I, I, I'll, I'll defer to, to Pat. And Chris on that, but I'll just mention that I think part of that really is about who shares the risk uh, and the burden of the cost of student loan debt. And then that's the students. And I think schools really need to have more skin in the game. And I think they have, but there has to be some mechanism of accountability. Uh, we don't want to get to a point down the road where something like IDR, which is meant to help people struggling, predominantly when they're just out of school and not making as much, we don't want that to become an insurance program for educational programs that aren't working. Myself. Great, thank you. Hi, Bob. This is anyway, uh, Pat. Yeah, this is, yeah, sir. This is Pat. Um, with regard to disclosures, um, a school in Indiana, Indiana University started this several years ago. It's now mandated in the state statewide. Um, it's also mandated in, in some other states. Nebraska, I think, is one uh, where the schools give the, the students an update on how much they owe and what their monthly payment is based on the amount they've already borrowed before they sign on the dotted line to accept their aid package for the next year, which typically for most students it, uh, will be include a, a federal student loan. So, and there is some indication as Bob referenced that borrowers will select to reduce the amount of the debt. They don't have to take the full amount if it's offered. They can try to get by with less. They have access to it later if they need it. But there seems to be some indication that it does help folks um, understand the burden they're taking on and whether or not they really need to take on that much debt to pay for college. And if they're keeping in mind how much they're going to owe in a payment when they get out into the work world. Now, this is still new and I think that there's going to be a fair amount of research trying to sort out just how valuable this type of notice is. But um, the, um, this is one area where we're seeing efforts to make sure that students have good information about how much um, their debt load actually is. I think one of the challenges of student lending uh, for the student loan consumer is that you don't get a loan in one clump. You get it over a number of years. And for some students, it takes up to five or six years to get the degree, maybe even longer if they drop out and then come back. And so I think it is not an easy system for them to keep track of how much they owe and how and how those loan amounts grow over time if they're accruing interest and unsubsidized loans pretty much are always always accruing interest except for of course in this um, period of the pandemic with the COVID protections in place. So it is a complicated beast and as it was pointed out these are 18 year olds a little bit older than that this is their first big credit product. It's hard for, um, I think, adults, you know, much older adults to understand what they're signing into. It must be a bit mystifying for someone younger if they have no um, uh, background in the responsibility of debt. So this is something that um, we definitely look at at the Bureau and we, um, what we can share information that we turn up. Great, thanks a lot. Thanks for that response. And and Rebecca, any follow up or is that? Great, thank you. Um, I, just a quick thing before we call in our next panelist, uh, our next uh, CAB member, which would be May Watson Grote. Uh, what would be interesting there, and it goes back to the point about financial literacy, is uh, 
we may tell a student, I think it's great for them to know how much they're going to owe, but to put that in the context of what a budget might look like and how much they will have to earn on a pre-tax basis and how much money they'll have on a post-tax basis, after-tax basis, and how much of their after-tax income that payment will take up to take that next step so that when they're in college, they can get a sense of, well, if, if you, if this is your job, this is what you can expect to earn, and this is what, this is the context of what the student loan will cost you and how much of your actual after-tax income it will take up. That may, that may help to close the circle, and that's where uh, organizations like credit counselors or some other budgeting tool or program, and I know that the Bureau has some on its website, but others are available, um, uh, can really help because that would, I think, would put uh, that student loan amount into context, so something to consider. And for any any um, institution of learning uh, that may be listening in or that you may speak to, uh, see if they can have that as a resource for kids who are in college or when they get out. Um, but I'll stop there. Let me turn to May. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. Um, again, I, I just want to thank the Bureau staff so much. Those presentations were um, really fantastic. There's a depth and quality to these presentations that I'm, I'm really appreciating. Um, and it even had me go back to some work that we did, um, had my kind of creative juices going to um, some research that we did earlier this year. We did a deeper dive um, um, about student loan debt among our customers. Um, and I was curious about whether the Bureau perhaps was seeing some um, similar findings. Um, and certainly similar to the, the last presentation around the mortgage market activity and trends, right, that the people of color disproportionately suffer compared to white borrowers. And what we found in particular that was that among individuals in the three youngest age groups, so under 30, 30 to 39, and 40 to 49, student loan balances were, were somewhat similar between black borrowers and white borrowers. Um, but the difference in student loan debt among our customers, um, first at the 50 to 59 mark, and then really at the, the 60 and above, was an extremely sharp divergence um, that white borrowers at, at the 60 plus mark, um, white borrowers owed an average of $25,000, while black borrowers owed um, 70. Um, and so we're curious um, whether the Bureau is saying something similar, or maybe even um, other community advisory group members, um, if you're picking up on similar trends. And then also just curious whether um, this is this is a matter of um, uh, factors true of all black borrowers, right? That they that's that black students face um, less favorable student loan terms. There's the racial um, income gap. There's the racial wealth gap, and that might that exacerbate um, at a, at an older age. Um, and then maybe there are there's an overlap with factors that are particular just particularly true for um, sixty. Um, year olds and plus, um, and we we have surmised that it it might be more a reflection of their total household student loan debt as they are not only coping with their own student loan debt, but perhaps that of um, their 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 children or grandchildren or other folks in their household. So, thank you, and looking forward to the response. Great, thanks, May, Bob, Patricia, or Kristen. Hi, this is Pat. No. I'll take a, the first stab here. I think you may be seeing a number of um, factors into the numbers that you cited. Um, once we get to older borrowers, they're not necessarily borrowers only for themselves. They'll still have their own loans from when they went to school. And especially if they are minorities, it takes them longer to, to pay back the loans. It looks like they spend longer times in early stages of deferment or forbearance when they um, come out of school and so their loan balances grow for a while. But also um, a lot of um, black families may be relying on the parent plus loan to help their children go to college, whereas they don't go for the private student loan for a number of reasons, but they take out the parent plus loan, which would be easier to qualify for than a private loan in many cases. Um, and um, they're, they've got, they're taking on the debt, as you pointed out, and you're seeing the household debt come on. Those parent plus loans benefit the, the child beneficiary 
of you know the student but they're always owed by the parent it is the obligation of the parent so that's one factor you may be seeing in there and then also it just takes that group longer to repay their loans um, people of color tend not to be uh, they tend to earn less and they tend to be unemployed more and once they're unemployed it, it's longer for them to become re-employed and I, there have been some studies that have pointed out those factors as um, contributing to the gap between um, the higher amount owed by uh, minorities versus white That's terrific, Pat. I really appreciate that. And I know that um, Jean um, Setsvend is here from the AARP, so maybe that might be a nice um, soft pass to her because I think from the AARP's, uh, certainly the AARP has a perspective on this too. Great, thanks, May. Uh, Jean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you uh, let me know if you want to weigh in on that, um, whether now or afterwards, that would be great. Sure, happy to do that. Uh, I think one of the um, points that's being raised right now is just the impact of student loans across um, intergenerational segments. Um, and that's definitely true. I don't have the uh, stats off the top of my head. Research that we've done ha has definitely shown, and the CFPB staff also alluded to this earlier, where the fastest growing segment of um, uh, borrowers um, uh, are amongst the 60 plus both in terms of uh, loans for their own education, but also as they carry on more debt for as a parent or grandparent. That was uh, alluded to before. One of the things that I'm actually thinking about across the board is trying to put all the pieces together, quite frankly. We're talking about student debt. We talked about housing issues. There's just financial burden across the board. Um, and I guess I'm looking at it from the lens of our constituents at AARP. And, um, there, there's so many factors at play um, from the housing to now student loan to health, quite frankly, and then loss of employment as well, uh, given I think everything that, that's, um, that they're facing. And yet, every time we talk about a particular topic um, and, and a vector associated with it, it's we're talking about how difficult it is. So if you multiply that across the various vectors and how complicated it is, I just feel like we're not dealing with all of these issues from more of a life and consumer perspective, but more so sort of the, the angle that we're dealing with each of these issues. I, I know it's important to do that, but the cross section of it is I think what I've been sort of sitting back and thinking about um, just a comment there. Thank you. Uh, incredibly important comment, uh, Jean, thank you. But it, it goes back to that part about the tie-in that, that these topics that we're talking about, it's the real life. It's you go inside your home and you close your door and you start worrying, how am I going to you know, pay for college? How am I going to pay the rent this month? How am I going to buy food? This is, this is what matters. Right, we're not talking about you know, international policy, about uh, you know, uh, the Arctic Ocean, which is important, but it's a lot more uh, tenuous compared to what affects us in our daily lives. Um, let me move on uh, next to Tim. You're up. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, Tim Welsh, uh, U.S. Bank. And again, big thanks to the Bureau uh, team for putting this material together. We're not in student lending, so it's fascinating to learn about. And I just had a couple of questions that tie together some of the themes we've been talking about. First, uh, Eric, you've touched a, a couple of times on the, the financial literacy uh, topic. This is something we're certainly paying. I know many financial institutions are paying a lot of attention to. And I'm wondering from the Bureau team if there is, or if there are prospects that financial education, financial literacy would somehow be tied to the student lending process so that as students go through this, they would also get some tools and uh, and frameworks and things to think about how to manage their debt along the lines of what Eric was describing. And then the second question was uh, picking up something uh, Rebecca had hypothesized, I think a quite reasonable hypothesis, which is that the impact of student loans uh, affect people's ability to uh, buy homes and many other decisions in their life. I'm wondering to the extent that the Bureau might have done any research on that to demonstrate that high debt levels do materially affect people all the way down the line, you know, throughout their lives. And if that research, if, if it exists, if it would be shareable 
uh, as a way of helping us uh, educate consumers as well. So any any thoughts on either of those questions would be much appreciated. This is Kristen, I can take this one. So for financial literacy, obviously I'm in the Office of Consumer Education, I'm biased, I really think financial education works. And so uh, we'd be happy to set up a demo to talk to some about our tools that we offer. We actually offer this one tool which we think can make a real impact on student loan borrowers. It's called Your Financial Path to Graduation. And it really just brings to life that decision that you're going to make to take out student loans. So. Um, I went to college, I went off to graduate school, I was floored when I came out of both of those with how much debt that I had, right? And so I kind of wish that I had someone to sit down with me and talk with me about what this all means if I borrow this amount, let's say for the next four, five years. And so uh, we really have done some user testing on these tools and as we sit students down and we walk them through the tool, they always come out at the end saying, I didn't know any of this stuff, right? And they've already taken out student loans at this point. So this is kind of the consumer education moment that we need to be giving to students and actually give them a pause and think about the student loan debt that they're going to take out, right? So that is the, and the first part of your first question. The second part is about this domino effect, right, of student loan debt, right? So you take out student loan debt, you are, you delay creating a family, getting married, buying a house or a car, all of those things. So the Bureau actually put out a report, um, I want to say it's 2014, but don't quote me on the year, uh, it's called Student Loan Affordability. We're happy to share that with you. It walks through some of the comments that we received from students who took out student loan debt, and it just kind of brings into the consumer experience and their perspective of taking on student loan debt. So we're happy to share that with you. I'd, I'd appreciate, appreciate follow up on both those. I'd be in, interested in connecting you with our team doing financial education, financial literacy, as well as, as well as understanding more about that report. So we can follow up separately. Thank you. That is spectacular, Tim. Thank you for that. Um, I, as you know, I'm of like mind uh, on those uh, on those topics. And Kristen, I've I've used that. I've actually gone through to see what that tool is like, and have recommended it to people so they could take a look because it is a it it seems complicated and foreboding, and um, but it really makes a difference to start cutting through. Um, so, you know, that's another thing, another reason why these kind of meetings to get the word out that those tools are available, because with all the resources that we've been talking about today that are there and that are free for people, it, it has to be amplified. The more people that know about this, and the more that they know that the resources are there for them to access. Uh, you know, the better off they are because the, the more that likely they are to use it. So thank you for that. Great. And thank you, Tim. Uh, next up will be Lee, Lee Phillips. Thanks, Eric. Um, just to build on some of the other comments, and I think really relevant to what we we're just hearing about the, the new tools or the tools that are available for decision making. Um, I sit on the board of another nonprofit called Money Think, which has recently launched um, a new app. Um, it's both student facing, but also designed to help um, high school guidance counselors. And in addition to it allows students to upload all of their financial um, aid. So anything they're getting from Pell Grants, any financial aid they're getting from the university uh, college itself, um, understand what the gap is between uh, that will have to be made up between uh, work programs, uh, parent or family contributions from savings or taking on um, student loans or debt and really helps the student to make a, a decision um, about which college or university might be best for them when you're looking at it through the lens of, um, of finances. But some of the other things that they consider, which I think are really interesting, are the graduation rates of those colleges, not just across the board, but for uh, based on demographics like race. So what percentage of, of students from different backgrounds actually go on to be successful? How supportive are universities and colleges of graduating students from different backgrounds? how much on average do students earn when they graduate from those colleges. And all of this, I think, goes into a pretty complex decision-making process where what's on the surface may not be actually the best decision when you take all of the information together um, and understanding how complex these are. They're also providing similar resources to guidance counselors to help them uh, advise students on these types of uh, decisions. So I wanted to just throw that out there that I do believe that technology and financial technology can play a major role in um, uh, creating tools that can really help this decision-making process so that we don't see um, 
you know, obviously people taking on more debt, students taking on more debt than they'll be able to afford or debt that perhaps wasn't worthwhile. Uh, but also the other problem of students maybe not uh, applying to or thinking that they can attend certain institutions based on cost, but that may not actually be an accurate picture. So I'm happy to share more information about that um, with CFPB staff or any of the, the CAB um, members if they're interested in, in learning more. We would certainly be interested in learning more. So please let's follow up uh, uh, with a follow-up meeting about that, absolutely. Great, I'll be happy to put you in touch. Thanks so much. It's great to see all these takeaways. Um, you know, it's interesting going back to schools and who can get to go to certain schools and not. Some of, uh, there are some schools with larger endowments that I know are now using those endowments for grants, particularly for um, students who come from underprivileged, low to moderate income families so that the the, the students don't have to work and take up their time through working to pay for work study and they don't take on loans. They're actually getting grants from those institutions. But then you you have questions about whether or not students from underserved communities can get to those schools. A lot of those schools have opened up avenues for those students to attend. Um, and then there's questions about uh, what employment looks like on the follow from different schools. And so that's it's um, these are great conversations to have and, and to follow up on. So um, another good reason for these convenings and, and for the cab itself. Uh, I want to turn next to Nikitra. We have, by the way, about 10 minutes. So uh, let me know cab members, any other comments? Uh, otherwise, after Nikitra, we'll start to tie up, um, but take it away. Thanks, Eric. I just want to remind us that we see um, these disparities um, in student loan debt again, um, going back to the racial wealth gap, right? Like we as a nation made a decision about who would be invested in through home ownership policy. Those families have been able to draw that equity to pay for higher education. So structural racism in the housing sector is really having an impact on the student loan um, sector and on the higher education sector. And then the Great Recession and the response to it um, really push states to actually draw down support that they initially had for student um, uh, loans in higher education. So we've seen like a big step back um, from, you know, equitable investments in higher education. So we see black and brown students um, particularly being in a situation where they have to take on more debt. So we, we know that for for black students, um, especially that, you know, four years post graduation, um, their debt is actually growing. It's not decreasing. And part of that is from broader societal discrimination. You know, we still have situations where people are paid unfairly. I mean, black women um, still are some of the lowest paid um, members of our workforce. Um, that's true for Latino women and for, for other women. So these disparities are also impacting the ability of um, people to really um, be able to, to drive down their debt. So, so those broader societal and systemic issues also have to be factored in and we need to see new social constructs. And that's why um, when we talk about higher education um, and, and giving people pathways to opportunity, you hear so many groups calling for flat out student loan debt cancellation. Um, people have been calling for at least um, $50,000 in student loan debt cancellation um, with a racial justice lens because of um, this history. Um, there was just a report that came out um, in the Wall Street Journal that showed that that more than 84% of college educated blacks in their 30s have um, seen their student debt rise um, up 35% um, from three decades ago. So that this younger generation is carrying about a median level of $44,000 up from less than $6,000. I mean, we have real structural issues and in, in what we see um, going on in this space. And we have to have those kind of broad um, structural solutions so that we can give people fair opportunities. Thank you, Nikitra. A bureau, any any thoughts or comments uh, in response to Nikitra? Um, I'll just say one thing. So, um, as you guys have seen, our acting director has put forth some priorities for the bureau, and racial equity is one of them. And Bob Pat and I have been thinking about what the intersection of higher education and racial equity and what that means for our work. And we recently did a webinar just highlighting some data and statistics about racial inequity in higher education. Um, and would be interested to learn more um, as we develop our plans going forward. So if anyone on this CAB membership would like to uh, talk with us about what they're hearing, what they're seeing, or recent studies that we should be taking a look at, we would love to hear that as well. 
Thank you. I'll, I'll definitely um, send over some information. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I want to say in the tab in the materials for the meeting, um, it was clear, at least to me, and I've done some work in student loans as sort of a prior life uh, in terms of the those markets. Which parts are dealt with on sort of the funding college front, and which parts really look back to what's happening in K through 12? And I know there's mention of that along that there was that element. We know there's that element, and looking back at um, you know, creating equality of opportunity and equity and inclusion in those in the K through 12 realm uh, in order to be able to access what a college has to offer um, and, uh, you know, at, at competitive prices and with opportunity after college. So, uh, you know, the good part is I know that the inquiry is there attacking it from both sides, which to Nikitra's point uh, speaks to the larger uh, part of the larger issue of what we've been talking about and that the Bureau, had, you know, is uh, echoed by Acting Director Wazio, making it a priority in terms of racial equity, social justice, uh, economic inclusion, and all the other topics that we know are part of the larger, uh, um, larger framework of what we're seeing today in the markets. Um, I want two quick things, and if there's uh, any other hands, let me know. Just a couple of final comments. It was really interesting to me that um, compared to mortgage, we're in mortgage. One of the things that I, I have not been thrilled with from the get-go is that uh, borrowers in forbearance have been considered delinquent for reporting purposes, which creates some confusion as to whether or not a borrower is considered delinquent because they've missed a payment is actually still struggling. Because within, if you say that, you know, there are 2 million borrowers who are delinquent, well, that's just because they've missed their payments now because of forbearance. You're still in you're required to make those payments under the note but you're not required to make those payments now. And you compare that to student loans where uh, the borrowers are not being reported as delinquent. One of the issues is what happens when that borrower exits uh, forbearance. We know that on the mortgage side, there's gonna be some, some issues, mistakes, errors made uh, for borrowers who didn't get an opportunity to talk to their servicers about loss mitigation coming out of forbearance Whereas at least in the student loan world, I'm hopeful that if the borrower is not considered delinquent, you sort of start fresh and see where the borrower is at that time. Layering on to that, uh, for borrowers who have to recertify their IDR programs, I hope that uh, there is there is very careful attention paid to that so that some borrowers aren't lost in the paperwork uh, and they're not considered delinquent when it's more a question of paperwork or miscommunication between borrowers and servicers. And that speaks to the care that servicers are going to put in. Um, and I look, I, I know in a mortgage perspective, servicers are trying to comply, but once again, there will be mistakes and errors. And hopefully there's attention to where things go off the rails, what the policies and procedures are, and how QA and QC can help uh, servicers to address uh, instances where things go awry and uh, not only act compliantly, but responsibly as well. And hopefully the Bureau uh, pays attention to that and at least understands where, uh, whether it's mortgage loan servicers, student loan servicers, or otherwise, are trying to comply and remedying uh, the situation where they don't, um, where they uh, fall short of the mark. Uh, let me ask again if there's any other uh, hands of the cab. If not, we will tie this up. I'll give about uh, 10 or 15 seconds for any cab member to jump in. Okay. Well, look, with that, um, I would like to tie up and uh, Bob and Pat and Kristen, thank you for this. Again, incredibly important topic um, and really top of mind for so many people. And uh, thank you for the work that, that you and your colleagues at the Bureau have been doing. And I, I want to stop there and see if there's any other comments from the Bureau before we wrap up the day. Okay, none being heard. Um, I will say this, I want to thank everyone. And before I turn it over to Manny for final thoughts, uh, I want to thank everyone uh, on the cab and all of the attendees and all of the bureau team, starting with Acting Director Wazio, all the way down to all staff members uh, and the ones who couldn't make it today. I want to reiterate what we talked about at the beginning of, uh, of today's uh, afternoon session. I, the work that the bureau is doing is all encompassing. Uh, we see it firsthand. Uh, people feel the results firsthand uh, in, in their day-to-day -day lives. 
We're talking mortgage loans, auto loans, credit cards, student loans, all of the products that go to people's um, the stability to afford their lives. And the amount of work that the Bureau is doing, it bears repeating, is, uh, is enormous. And if it's a problem for you in your household, if you're thinking that, that you're, you have your own issue or if you're seeing that there's an issue across society, chances are the Bureau is doing that work and they're aware of it. Just in case, if they're not, if there's something that you think the Bureau should be aware of, please reach out to the Bureau, reach out to one of us, reach out to you know, any of your creditors. Uh, the information must make its way back to the Bureau and even if they're aware of it, all viewpoints are informative and uh, they, are, they are additive to the policy making and regulatory process. And also to uh, industry participants, consumer advocates and other stakeholders as well. So I do want to reiterate my thanks to the Bureau for that. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to serve on the CAB on behalf of all CAB members as well. Uh, thank you for the work that you do. And uh, Manny, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, and I want to say another big thank you for the Bureau staff for uh, such you know, great presentations throughout the day. And certainly uh, appreciate CAB members, you know, thought provoking comments, questions, statements that keep us honest and engaged in, in what we have to do, right? So um, again, thanks so much for making time today. Um, and we look forward to future engagements with advisory committee members in the coming weeks. And with that, um, uh, Tracy, the meeting uh, is concluded. Thank you again. All. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Bureau. Thank you, CAB members.